Happy Friday, guys, and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Dubs. I'm your host, Bill T. Man, I'm excited for this Friday, and we are kicking off with a great podcast for you guys. Uh, we'll get into that in just a minute, but lots of things have been going on. As of today, several things are starting to transpire. I got a lot of irons in the fire and 50 million things going sideways. So I've got a car back in Pennsylvania that uh, Mike Mays is working on for me. He had an MPG TV bug. It's called the Milwaukee Miracle. It was a true barn find that was found a few years ago in Milwaukee, 1970 GTV Beetle. And uh, he had it on the GTV page. I ended up buying it from him. And then we ended up coming up with a plan to get it a little more roadworthy. And just this week, we stepped up with Impy because what better to restore an Impy GTV than with the help of Impy? So, reached out to my friend Rob over at Impy to get some stuff to get this car roadworthy because the plan is to get this thing back together, drive it cross country, and uh, maybe make it to the Impy open house if that's a possibility. So, cool things happened with the 70 GTV Beetle. So, I'm excited about that. In addition to today, Zorba the Gia has arrived at Andy Finch's place in the UK. So pretty excited about that. Uh, the plan is to be up there in June, grab the car and uh, hit the road on the cow look caravan. That's going to be going all the way through uh, Germany, Belgium, uh, Netherlands, all that stuff. So I'm excited for that. Big things are happening. Going to give you guys lots and lots of content to listen to and some videos to watch on YouTube. I've got a couple of videos I'm working on right now that will be coming up soon. So make sure you go subscribe to my YouTube channel. It'll be the uh, process of dropping off the car and the arrival and the process of all that in between to ship a car to the UK, as well as the supercharger video that I have coming out. And I'm going to be working on the first of a series of the MPGTV Milwaukee Miracle uh, video. So lots of stuff to be coming out here. I just keep making myself busier and busier, but I'm looking forward to it. Uh, and looking forward to this podcast. So this podcast, I have been hounding my buddy Russell for a long time to come on the podcast and to, you know, really uh, get his story. Russell Ludwig with Old Speed has been in the VW scene for a very long time. He's one of the originators on a lot of different stuff. Unbelievably smart. If you ever get a chance to sit down and chat with him, he really He's really into doing what he does and his story, after you hear his story, you'll understand why he has a tendency to be so meticulous about some things that he does and he's really um, committed to doing the job correctly. So Russell's got years and years of experience. I remember one of the first cars that I saw, you'll hear the story, it was his single cab at the Jamboree in 89 or 90 and seeing the big giant tack on the dash and ever since I saw that, I thought if I ever have a bus, I'm putting a big fat tack on the dash. And every bus I own has a five inch auto meter on the dash. So one of those things that you see when you're young and it sticks with you. So I'm excited to bring this podcast interview to you guys, because if you don't know Russell, you should go check out a shop down in Paramount, California. Uh, he does. You're looking for some rad brakes and stuff like that. Russell's your guy. He's. He's been there, he's done that, and definitely can lead you in the right direction. It's the best way to set your car up. So um, other than that, make sure you guys go check out our sponsors. VW Trends Magazine, a magazine for the people, by the people. Be on the lookout for a new ad. Give me your feedback on the new ad when you see the next issue of VW Trends Magazine come out. Let me know what you think. Bobby D created the ad, so give me some feedback on that. In addition to check out Ross Wolf. Are you tired of your drain plate leaking from your Volkswagen? Well, check out Ross Wolf's new Vitan gaskets and their sump plate covers. Washers have rubber, siliconized rubber uh, O-rings on them, as well as the reusable Vitan gasket. So get your stuff tightened up. No more oil leaks in the driveway. And while you're at it, pick up a self-locking dipstick. So check out Ross Wolf today at rosswolf.com. If you're restoring your Volkswagen and only NOS VW parts will do, go to VWNOS.com. That's VWNOS.com. Go check out their website. All they carry is original equipment Volkswagen parts. And for a discount, don't forget to put the code LTD when you check out. So LTD is the discount code. Go check them out if you're only looking for original equipment parts for your Volkswagen restoration. Go to VWNOS.com.
Well, looking at my Gucci, it's about that time to get into it. This week's podcast, super excited for this. Russell Ludwig with Old Speed on this week's Let's Talk Dubs. You probably don't know that there's a new Volkswagen out that doesn't look like a Volkswagen. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, everybody. So on today's podcast, I have a special guest in the studio with me here. Um, this guy in particular, I've met him back, uh, I would think it's probably around the year 2000, 2001. It happened to be a Pomona swap meet, and I was selling some stuff there. And I told this guy that was selling stuff next to me in the booth that I was building the baddest bus he'd ever seen. And he said, oh, you're building a bus? What kind of brakes are you doing for it? And I said, I don't know what kind of brakes I'm doing. So we ended up working on a trade. And uh, this guy helped me get my brakes done for the bull run bus. So this was way back in the bull run bus day. So uh, this guy you'll know because he's been in the VW scene for a very long time. Uh, one of the main shops in Southern California based out of Paramount. And lately he's, I mean, he's been working on stuff for probably over 30, 35 years. And he, he's got an unbelievable breadth of knowledge. And we're going to get into a lot of that today. But more importantly, we're going to get his story. So on today's podcast, I want to welcome... Russell Ludwig from Old Speed. Russell, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me, Bill. This is a pleasure to be here. Well, I, at your home, especially. I, you know, I'm super stoked to have you on here. It's been, uh, for me, you know, I've been hassling you since I started the podcast. I thought, like, Russell, we got to get on here because you've got a huge story to tell. You've been around, you've been in the game a long time. And when I first met you was at Pomona when I actually picked up, um, when I picked up the, uh, I'd gotten races and the kit to put the 944 brakes on the bull run bus. And I was uh, committed to building this super cool German look bus. And then we kind of connected. And the first time that I'd ever seen Old Speed ever was at the 1989, 89 or 90 Jamboree inside the steel building they used to have there in Costa Mesa where they do the swap meet. I remember there was a single cab there on Fuchs and it had on the two windows, it had old speed on the windows and it had a fat tack on the dash. And when I came up on the car, I was like, bro, my bus is getting a fat tack on the dash. And every, every seriously, every bus that I've had, I have to have the big five inch auto meter tack on the dashboard. So since then, it's like I always associated old speed with, um, kind of performance buses just because of that first visual that I got and the origins and really what I want to talk about today is kind of the origins of old speed how the whole thing started how everything came about and I believe now this is me just guessing from the outside right I think being in the VW scene in the in the late 80s early 90s there was a company called new speed and they sold water pumper parts and it was a water pump performances I was guessing that old speed was a playoff of new speed type stuff, but kind of a retro thing. Is that what that, the, it absolutely was? Yeah, so that was the entire point of it. And and for me, that was super cool. Now, the way we always start the podcast is what's your VW story and how did you get into Volkswagens? So, so my VW story really was at first that I didn't like Volkswagens. I didn't want any part of Volkswagens. Said I would never own a Volkswagen. <laughs> And um, that that was because my father didn't like Volkswagens. Really? And the reason he didn't like Volkswagens wasn't because he, he didn't ever experience one and, and enjoy it. It was because his buddies liked Corvairs. And we were going off-roading. I grew up with uh, desert trips and uh, riding motorcycles and riding in sand rails. And um, his buddies that had the Corvair-powered sand rails they worked the best. And his buddies that had the Volkswagen sand rails were always breaking down. And so I just had this knowledge of that experience and being a kid and my dad's friends who were very instrumental in my upbringing uh, with camping and fishing trips and all the things that we did, they always talked down on the Volkswagens. So ultimately, I had that negative connotation built into me. Um, 
when I was in high school, uh, of course, there was Volkswagens everywhere. Right. What, now, and, now, you're a couple years older than me. What year did you graduate? 1983. Okay. And I had a, my very first car was a 1969 Mercury Cougar. And nice. um, it, it was relatively fast after I added dual exhaust and did some tune-up work to it with help from other people. I didn't know anything. Um, I grew up um, in central Long Beach, and uh, my dad had a six-car garage with a bathroom, a washer and dryer, and a telephone in the garage. Really? And then our side yard, we could fit six or eight cars in it, and we had a camping trailer parked there. And so um, eventually when I took over the backyard in the garage, I filled it up with VWs. But I guess we have to backtrack uh, to my first VW to start this out, right, is I had a high school friend who wanted to move away. He had a 1960 Beetle, mm -hmm. 60, which I learned later is the oddball bastard year of all, right. of all cars to ever own. And so that being my first one um, created a lot of challenges, which challenges are good in life because it helps you to learn and things to overcome. Um, so anyways, he, he twisted my arm to buy this car. I didn't want the car. I didn't want a Volkswagen. And he um, convinced me that he was moving. Well, he didn't convince me. He was moving away to Brazil to study. And he had advertised his car in, I think, the Recycler, and it wasn't selling. And uh, he was asking $1,800 for it. And he told me, give me 1300 bucks for it. I'm leaving town in a week. I just, I need the money. So honestly, as a favor to him, I bought the car. For thirteen hundred dollars. For thirteen hundred bucks. That's a lot of. What year is this? It was in nineteen eighty four, I think. That's a lot of money in eighty four for a bug. It was, but it was a nice car. Was it? It was clean, painted, um, all stock, six volt, thirty six horse, all original. Um, but it had been, it had a single repaint, and um, it was a nice car. I bought it as a favor, thinking that yes, I could make some money on it, and uh, for me, that was the name of the game: was to buy and sell cars and make money, and uh, so I bought this thing. And the first step was, of course, to lower it mm -hmm. because it was all stock. And so we moved into, you know, how do you lower it? Well, I had one friend, Chris, my best friend from elementary school that had a Volkswagen. And uh, he talked about pulling out the torsion bars. So uh, we did that job. But um, before we get too deep into all that, I'd like to kind of go back to the origin of just me, which yeah, is, you yeah. know, uh, my dad... Uh, was from Maine. Well, when, I, I'm surprised your dad was such a car guy. I mean, it seems like your dad's a huge car guy. He he was not a car guy at and all. Why do you have a six car garage? And well, he so he didn't have any cars in it. He just had a big garage because that was the house we ended up in. So my father uh, grew up in Maine, and to get out of Maine, he um, joined the military when he was 17 years old, and uh, ended up in Korea, and that's where he found my mom. And so he brings home this you know, Korean war bride and, uh, brings her back to Maine. And she's like, well, we can't stay here. You know, I want my kids to grow up in a place of opportunity. So she convinced him to move to California. So we came to California in 1969 or 68. So I was only three years old, but the home that he bought had been, uh, built by, a, a fireman and the fireman had, you know, a flexible schedule and he built this massive garage. So oh, it just, it. it just turned out that it was there. And, um, which was great because my dad got into motorcycles and uh, and bicycles, and my mother used the garage to do furniture upholstery because mm. she didn't, uh, you know, she she came here not speaking the language and not not having the skills to to get work other than uh, being a seamstress, which she was. But anyway, she did furniture upholstery in the house and, and in the garage, and I worked uh, side by side with her. I was very young, mm -hmm. five five six years old, and. Uh, helping her stretch the fabric and helping her put tack strips in the backsides of, you know, household furniture. And having two older brothers, I'm the youngest of three, I have a nine, nine year old brother, uh, nine years older than me, and another brother that's three years older. So we had a lot of bicycles laying around and uh, surfboards and skateboards and everything that kids have. But there was a lot of abundance of it because we had this big garage and my dad didn't throw anything away. So everything got collected. So at about age six, I assembled my first bicycle out of leftover pieces from all the other bikes that were laying around. Nice. And uh, unable to tighten the uh, bolts tight enough and things, I would hammer on the wrenches. And my dad had pretty good tool supply, and everything was clean and organized. And uh, he was an electrician, kind of, not, not by trade. But the garage had outlets every six feet, nice workbench, a vice, air compressor, oxyacetylene torches. You know, he was... All of his friends were in that stuff, and he wanted to go off-roading and stuff with them. So 
he had the definitely had the right friend group. Um, so learning that I could take pieces and parts from any different bicycle and adapt them to fit mm -hmm. that transpired later in life to cars. Sure. So, um, you know, everything comes together eventually. So I think I was 13 years old when the uh, Toyota that my dad had, uh, a 73 Toyota Corona wagon, water pump went out. And he's at work, and I'm thinking, it's summertime, and I'm at home, you know, what do we do at summertime besides eat hot ramen and top ramen and hot dogs, right? So, <laughs> right? so uh, I'm like, hey, Dad, you want me to try to change that water pump? And he's like, yeah, let me get uh, Jerry or, or Tom or whoever it was on the phone with you to guide you through changing this water pump. And so 13 years old at home, I changed the water pump, and it, it was not difficult. So... Then later on, um, my dad helped me buy my first car, which was a 69 Cougar. He bought it from a friend. It had about 80,000 miles on it. Uh, he got it for 50 bucks. So we dragged this thing home, and he had just done a tune-up to it because it wasn't running right, and it still wasn't running right, and that's how my dad got it for me for $50. Well, um, I'm a book guy, so I looked in books and tried to figure out you know, how these things work, mm -hmm. and uh, the firing order was wrong. So... He was probably doing a tune-up because it, was, it wasn't was running right. Then during the process of the tune-up, he actually made it worse. So once I got all the spark plug wires in the right locations, the thing ran fine. Yeah. So I, I lucked out and got a $50 car. So I'm driving this thing to high school, and, and um, there's um, tire shops and muffler shops and everything where they would leave stuff out in the back. I mean, this is the 80s. It was, right, right. You know, and so I could find good used tires, found some mufflers, found some tubing, had a gas oxyacetylene welder. I chopped everything out, used coat hangers, and made my own dual exhaust system, and, and uh, took it over to Arnie's tune-up, and he helped me jet it a little bit to get the, the flow better because I had opened up the exhaust, and now my car was faster, so it was great. So we used to have a place in Long Beach, uh, Santa Fe and Delamo, where we would always go street racing. So go up there, and you know you get, you get waxed by a Volkswagen when you're driving your V8 car, and you think, wow, this is something... This is something different. <laughs> you showed up, showed up in the old Cougar. Yes. And you and, got it handed to and, you? Oh, yeah. It definitely got handed to me. Really? So my friend, my good friend, Chris Kumiyama, he um, had a 2180 with FK89 and 48s, a fiberglass front end. And uh, he's like, you got to drive this car. And I was like, nah, I don't want to break your car. And he's like, no, you got to drive it. I don't think I revved it higher than five grand first through third, and I got out of that car and I was shaking. My my yeah. my voice was cracking and my my clutch foot was sh shaking. I had never experienced something like that, and I'm like, I got to have one of these <laughs> <laughs> at some point in time. Yeah, but I didn't really have that much money. So um, my parents, um, unfortunately and fortunately, bought a restaurant. And uh, me and my two brothers became slave laborers. Uh, <laughs> That's the, the way it works in, in the family business. In the family business, yes. We worked 54 hours a week for $20 a piece. And um, it was tough times. And um, I wanted to earn some of my own money. And as a little kid building bicycles, my father, um, he was quite the, quite the guy, really. He um, taught me how to make money. He goes, hey, I want to show you how you can do this. As a child, you can go purchase something from somebody and you can make them a low offer and because you're a kid they'll take it and then when you're going to sell it a grown man's not going to beat up a little kid on the price right so you can sell it and get money so you can make money on this stuff right i'll help you so my father was retired air force i could buy bicycle inner tubes and tires for like 55 cents at the at the navy px yeah so um make a long story short on that bicycle thing is that by about age 13 I had bikes being sold bought and sold bought and sold all the time because he, he would bring stuff home his buddies would be like oh your kids building bikes here you can have this bike so all this stuff started flowing in and I'd strip them all down and my dad would take them back to work and sandblast the frames and then we'd hang them in the garage and he taught me how to spray paint them and then you know he taught me how to put them back together so ultimately my dad created this little mechanic and, yeah. and I was buying and selling bicycles at a very young age and uh, making money on it. Then my parents bought this restaurant. We all, we all put our money in and, and uh, went broke for, for four years. But 
during that time period, I started thinking, okay, I, I can do this with cars, the same thing I was doing with bikes. I'm, yeah. I'm young enough that I can go make low ball offers and people will sell me stuff that they're, they'll sell it to me half of what they're asking if their advertising is not good. So we didn't have internet, you know, we had the recycler and we had the thrifties newspaper ads. And um, this, this $1,300 Volkswagen turned out that I ended up keeping it because hardly anybody was given the accolades on the Cougar and I, I also bought Ford Mustangs yeah. and I had a 55 F100 pickup truck. But when I got in that Volkswagen and you go into a gas station, everyone's like, hey, man, that's a nice bug. And blah, blah, blah. And they start telling you their Volkswagen story. Everybody's got history with a VW. Yeah. It seems like everybody has a Volkswagen history. So that part I fell in love with also. Plus, no water, no radiator. Yeah. No, no big mess. You can take an yeah, engine out. Yeah, when you're a kid and you're trying to deal with the overheating problem, man, that's like the end of the world. Yes, it is. It absolutely is. So in high school, <clears throat> my mother um, had this restaurant, my father and my mother. Um, I needed to make some side money, and I um, said, hey, Mom, me and my friend Paul Baker, we want to buy and sell some cars, um, but we don't have any money. Um, can I borrow some money from you? Because I found this good deal. And she says... I'll loan you the money. It wasn't very much. I'll loan you the money, but you got to pay interest on it. And it's not because I need your money. I need you to understand the value of time and money combined. And they go hand in hand. You can't have, you can't just borrow money and then pay it back whenever. If you're paying interest on it, you're going to want to pay it back sooner. And she goes, and the other thing is you can't have a partner. You have to do it alone. Partnerships don't work. At least in her opinion. Yeah. So I'm not arguing. <laughs> okay. So I'm all right. I'm 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 okay. So sorry, Paul, but I got to do this on my own. So I borrowed some money from her, bought a Mustang, had it painted, put the thing up, sold it, made some money, paid her back, bought two more Mustangs, fixed them up a little bit, sold them, made some money. I traded my Mercury Cougar for a 55 F100 Ford pickup truck. Always wanted one. Had a 289 in it. Blew the engine up, pushed that thing by myself for three blocks. Mm. Very difficult. Yeah. I didn't know if I was going to make it. So then I got this great idea that, you know what, I want to put a big block in it. And back then you could buy a 429 or a 460 out of pick your part. Mm -hmm. They would start them up and show, show you that they ran, you know. And uh, you could buy them for relatively cheap. So I bought this engine. Then I had to put a Lincoln Continental radiator in front of it. It had to have the drive shaft shortened. had to do the motor mounts. It took me a whole year. My, my entire high school year, senior year, I think, I worked on this stupid truck, which was fine. It worked out great. Um, eventually, when I got into the Volkswagen thing, and I had friends that, uh, this friend Chris, that showed me that you could take these torsion bars out to lower the front, I'm like, wow. These cars are simple. These cars are easy. They're abundant. Everybody's got one in their backyard. They're all for sale for relatively cheap when they don't run. I'm going to make money on these things. Forget these Ford Mustangs. Let me see if I can make some money in the Volkswagens. So I started buying those. You could pick up the recycler on Thursday morning mm -hmm. and um, pick the ones that the ad just said, Thursday morning or Wednesday night if you're up at one o'clock in the morning when they're delivering. Could you get it that early? <laughs> well, oh, here they did. here they would do it. They would deliver it at, like the recycle would drop Thursday, so it'd be like Wednesday night or Friday they dropped them here. So Thursday night you got there when they were delivering the papers, you'd be the first one to get it. <laughs> that was kind of the that was the move, right? Once you started to realize, okay, now how do I get this first? Yeah, yeah, they were great. I would choose the ones that the advertisement was lame. It just yeah. says VW Bug, twelve hundred dollars, no description. No, nothing, right? Those are the ones you call because nobody else is calling them. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're reading the ones with all the great descriptions of converted to 12 volt, lowered new tires, blah, blah, blah. A lot of times they were gems. They just weren't, they just weren't advertised correctly. Yeah. And uh, so usually you could find an advertisement for a car for 1200 and um, go look at it, pick it up for 800 And then they give you all these boxes of extra parts and all this stuff just comes with it and uh that part was cool the best part of the purchase yeah yeah definitely the best part of the purchase is all the spare parts that come with it so i'd like to back up a tiny bit too um i was driving my 60 bug and i was working um at chief auto parts i think and directly across the street from chief auto parts was the long beach dmv so they're going to be a high traffic zone for 
car people. Yeah, for selling DMV, cars, buying right? cars. So I'm working at Chief Auto Parts, and I'm parking a bug at the DMV parking side of the street with a for sale sign in it with my name and number at Chief Auto Parts to come inside. So I could sell a Volkswagen every week. Really? To buy and sell a, a I would sometimes pick up two on the recycler days, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, clean them up, polish the paint, lower them, paint the rims white, put on new hubcaps from, I think it was Jerry's VW Heaven or uh, it wasn't Bill and Steve, Steve's Foreign Car Parts, those recycler ads that were tiny and they put out tons of stuff for dirt cheap. So it was it was easy pickings because there was Volkswagens everywhere. And um, it was a lot of fun. It really was. And I learned that uh, they're so easy to work on. You can yank out the engine, pull off the sheet metal, torque the heads, adjust the valves. So when do you start, when do you decide you're gonna you're gonna do this for a full-fledged business? Do you do you start Old Speed without a name, like just at, the da at Dad's house with the big garage and all that stuff? No. I, I just started buying and selling cars because that was the easy way for me to make some money. Mm -hmm. And then um, this guy, Tom Harper, that had um, helped me work on my Mercury, the first guy that really gave me some real assistance, he decided that he wanted to open a Mazda rotary engine shop and um, to make a little side cash. I was doing all kinds of different things. So um, you work on Mazdas too? You didn't care? Yeah, when we, had the, um, when we had the restaurant, I wasn't making any money with mom. So it was side money. So I had a job in a pizza place, and then I did uh, rotary engine porting for this guy, Tom. So I was, we were, he was building uh, bridge ports, and I was doing the street ports. And um, that was a nasty job, ca uh, cast iron porting. It's, yeah. horrible. it's horrible, because all those little tiny sharp shavings end up in your socks and everywhere. But um, good experience. Um, I went to work for Chief Auto Parts for a while. All this was while I was going to college. So. Really, it was all about just flipping cars and learning how to um, work on them. And what were you going to college and for? How to make them, and how to make them faster. Of course, everything was about going faster. Yeah. Um, I studied um, business marketing at Cal State Long Beach, and I called it Russell's Garage. After I started taking actual business, I had a really good friend. Uh, his name was Cheeto, and he said, um, you know, you're giving away a lot of your time. You're learning a lot on cars, but... A lot of people are just hanging out because you're you're helping them. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, I'm helping people, but I'm also learning a lot. And he goes, I think you should start charging people. And he goes, you know how cheap I am, but I'm willing to pay you. But only if everybody pays you. You can't just take my money. You have to make it the rule. You're not working on anything if you're not getting paid. And you know what? That was some of the best advice I had ever been given especially by a friend, yeah. you know, not a parent, not an elder, but a peer. This guy told me, you've got a good opportunity here, but you need to capture it and capitalize upon it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, having been slightly impoverished during that time period that my parents had this restaurant mm -hmm. was an excellent lesson because um, suddenly, yes, time and money go together and and it's going to run out at some point so you got to make the most that you can and uh within reason and um so i'm going to college and i'm starting to put these russell's garage business cards on every volkswagen that i see at the cal state long beach parking lot oh really yeah which and there's probably a ton of them there was and pretty soon i had more business than i could handle working out of my garage and the fact that there was a phone in the garage was beautiful and um, my dad, he kind of encouraged, my mother discouraged it, but my dad encouraged it and would take messages and write down people's phone numbers and I could call them back. And um, eventually I got a pager and then that way people could call me and that way it wasn't bothering my parents nearly as much with all these phone calls. But um, it blew up. I had so much work, I couldn't handle it. And I was um, going to school full time, working on cars full time, and uh, then this guy, um, Tom Harper, he says, hey, uh, I'm teaming up with ATK North America, one of the largest engine importers in the world, or in the US, and uh, I want you to come work for me. We're gonna build Mazda rotary engines. And I didn't know where I wanted to go in life. I was just going to school because my mom told me to. And um, 
I decided to quit school. And I went to work full time in this Mazda rotary engine shop. And I built really? nine, I built 900 Mazda rotary engines. Really? And it was uh, great and horrible all at the same time. <laughs> now, the, the Mazda thing, there was, because, you know, touching back to street racing, there was a ton of Mazda stuff in the street racing game. I mean, like, back back in those days, were there guy, were, I would assume there's guys out there street racing Mazda stuff, too? There were. There was lots of guys doing Mazdas. And this guy, Tom, he built some fast stuff, and some of the guys that uh, it seemed like it was hoodlums and drug dealers that had the Mazdas and actually a lot of street racers were hoodlums and drug dealers which well yeah I mean the, it's, it's a way that they're getting because I, I do want to touch on a little bit of the street racing stuff that, that you were that you were, the, some of the people that you knew because there's a lot of there I think you could do if you got the right guys together you could do just an entire podcast on the early the mid 80s early 90s street racing scene in LA Long Beach area that kind of stuff but I think there's a whole story just on that in and of itself with there, so, there so many layers of things that are happening. But the first, what's the first motor that you build Volkswagen? Like, like, cause you do a lot, you do motors, you do suspension, you do everything. And, and, and you've kind of been known for your suspension, right? Like really you spent a lot of time with suspension and brakes, but in the early days, well, you know, knocking leafs out all stuff. When do you finally start stepping up your game and saying, "Nope, this is the way"? Like, is it is it after you get old speed and you're and you're thinking to yourself, "I really want to take this to the next level with, uh, like, really doing things right"? And because you're really a methodical kind of, you've got. I, I think all the years you spent porting cast iron and doing that kind of stuff, it, it taught you patience, right? Like I couldn't do that. I had a fiberglass layup job for like two weeks and I couldn't take it. Like it was just, it was too much concentration, too much focus on one little thing. And it was like, I, I'm more of a, I can't do that. You know, I, I'm just a different, I'm, I'm cut different. Right. So when it, when do you start and do you first start building engines for people or do you first start doing suspension stuff well, when i took this mazda rotary <clears throat> engine job mm -hmm. they were part of atk and atk had a volkswagen division so oh, really? there was this guy there named robin i don't remember his last name i'm sure that some people that hear this podcast will know who robin was um he worked in the warranty department for atk for the volkswagen side and i was driving the volkswagen so he struck up conversation with me and pretty soon he started giving me all this stuff because there was warranty stuff that he just had piles of it and didn't need it so i'd get pistons and cylinders and cranks and rods and all kinds of pieces and pretty soon i could piece together engines um my very first engine i built out of the book because i had friends that were offering to help and uh, that never happened it was, you know everyone's schedule was different and we're all right. busy doing our thing and and i thought you know what i'm a book guy let me just look in the book and figure out how to do this. So I built a 1776, um, same as building a 1600, but just bigger pistons. So um, that assembly went together fine, ran good. Um, I think I got a lot of guidance from Bob at DeMello's Machine Shop. Mm -hmm. I, I don't mean guidance on my first engine, of course. I, I kind of mean guidance in life. Bob was a great guy. And um, this VW community actually is full of great people. And everybody has... Uh, contributed so much to my existence and it's been it's been good well when you like you we talked earlier about you listen to clyde berg's podcast but when right. you talk about all these guys that are the guys now they were just the other guys in the business and he'd go hang out at so-and-so's place after work and they'd go talk and it's this community that that kind of helps because it's like, hey, you're the up and coming kid. Let me give you some advice, kid. Before you waste your time doing X, Y, and Z, go down this direction and pick fruit off these trees. There's more to get over here versus over there. Don't go like those other guys and waste a bunch of time. And there's a lot of people that they see that that fire you have in your belly when you're a young kid. And you're like, man, this thing's working for me. It's printing money. You know what I mean? And there, there's that sense of family in the VW world for oh, the most sure. part. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, like you and I, we met years ago. Ever since we met, we've always just kind of been buddies. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it was years before I was even buying stuff from you just because it was like, I'd see you at the shows. Oh, here's, there's the guys from Vegas. And then you guys would come here to the Vegas show. And, you know, there's just this thing. And, and one of the funny parts is, Doing this podcast, we talked. You talked about my motivation for the podcast. I remember one of the guys, Greg Banfill, 
when I got Greg on the podcast, I was like, hey, dude, look, I do a podcast. I see you at all the freaking shows. We're always like, hey, what's up? What are you up to? But just casual conversation. But I'd love to just kind of get your whole story and just and get to know you a little bit. And we did the podcast. And it's funny because sometimes you meet people in passing at these events and these shows and things like that. And, and you think, oh, that guy, you know, you, you kind of have your perceived notion of who he is. But when you sit down and talk to him and you kind of get their story and you get a little bit back where it's like, man, Greg's one of the funniest dudes I know. And you'd meet him and be like, oh, is this big freaking, this big lug that looks like he's all business and he's not right. a very nice guy, but he's, he's just a crack up. You know what I mean? Like if you get to know him and sometimes, you know, in and out of show, stuff like that, we don't really get to spend a lot of time chatting with each other because we're, we're all there for, you know, different things that we're up to. But it's been really good to get to know so many people by just doing the podcast long form and creating friendships with, you know, all these people. But the community in and of itself is interesting because there's all these layers that build one off another and another off right. another and, and, and all these things that come together. And, you know, like you were telling me, Bob at DeMilla Machine was really somebody that, that would kind of give you some. Yeah, yeah, he was a mentor. And so was Mike Walter at Griffin's Machine Shop. Um, He's the guy that told me, do it right. Just do it right the first time. Because I would take up stuff there and be like, hey, can you grind this one seat? He's like, no, I'm not going to grind the one seat. I'm either going to rebuild the head or I'm not going to touch it. Right. I'm going to surface it and I'm going to change the guides. I'm going to do it right. He's like, come on, kid, just do it right. And I'm like, okay, but I had this abundance of used stuff and I was always trying to piece everything together mm -hmm. as inexpensively as possible. And, um, you know, that's a good lesson in life as well is, you can do it as cheap as you can, but you may have to do it over and over and over. Right. But during that process, you're learning things. So I don't really think there's any regret about the way things have gone. You know, doing this podcast is actually kind of difficult because it makes you think about how everything's interconnected and it's hard to hard to make it flow from beginning to end as far as where I'm at and how I got here. So my so my next question is you have Russell's garage for how many years and when do you decide to start? Old speed. Okay, so I had Russell's Garage going pretty well. From what year to what year? Um, from like 84 to 89, 84 to 88. And um, I was in Central Long Beach, surrounded by West Side, East Side, North Side, and South Side. And all these gangbangers had Volkswagens, and I worked on them. And they would call. And this is the height of the gangster <clears throat> rap era. Like, like gang violence is pretty intense at this time. They would call and say, who's there? And I would have to name off who's there. And at one point, I mean, I, I, I didn't grow up in any of that. Right. And I didn't ever think that <clears throat> way. And I never really realized what was happening. I didn't know that my house was a neutral zone. Oh, really? So finally, I said to a guy, I said, hey, you can stop by whenever you don't need to call me first. And I was actually irritated. It's like, I got to stop what I'm doing to answer this phone You were a little call. naive to what was going and, on. And all the guy was doing was asking who's there. And I said, look, you can come by whenever. And he says, no, I can't come by because there's somebody there that I want to kill and I don't want to do it at your place. <laughs> that's pretty... And, and that's what, that was an eye opener to me. I'm yeah. like, really? So here I am in this middle of this war zone, but these guys call it truce at my place. Right. And in a strange way that, made me feel somewhat protected yeah in, in, in an odd way anyways i did fix up a lot of these cars and um kept a lot of these guys rolling and that was great then now I, these were these were street race guys no these were just daily driving cars so what happened there with the street race scene you you, you touched on that is that roland rascon um well before we get into that so you, you're doing this thing and you're getting ready to start old speed. Like how does it, but old he's Roland Roland's a big part of this. Okay. So Roland wanted to go fast mm -hmm. and I hadn't ever really built any big motors that were fast, but Paul Molina had a friend of mine and, um, with his help and guidance, I built Roland a 2110 with an FK 89 and some HO heads that Fred Simpson did. And, uh, he had 48 IDAs and a four-tuned exhaust, and I think it was in a uh, a 55 hardtop, mm -hmm. and it was pretty fast. And then Roland was out there street racing all the time, and uh, you know win some, lose some, but he could break anything and everything that we put together. So breaks it. Then you know we go to Bob, we need another crank, 
Bob's like, you got a wedge made it. What are you guys doing? So we tell him what we're doing. And uh, it went, it just progressed. Everything had to get faster. Everything you started had to learning get stronger. all the things you got to do as we, you're building more power. We learned about the high performance stuff. So Roland became my first full-time employee out of my father's garage. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> because he wanted to he wanted to go fast, but he didn't have the money and the knowledge. So you're and, like, help me work on these cars. Right. Help me fix all these stock Volkswagens, <laughs> and I'll help you make your car faster. And we had enough business, really, to run a full-time shop out really? of my dad's garage while I'm going to college. And um, so, like I said, I quit college to start the rotary thing. Yeah. Did that for a year. Went back to college with a, a vengeance. I'm like, okay, I'm doing this for me. I'm not doing this right. for mom anymore. I'm doing this so that I don't have to be an assembly line production worker. I'm going to become a businessman instead or get a job. But a job that's not monotonous. Building Mazda rotary engines was monotonous. They were all stock ones. I never learned how to tune one. I was just building long blocks, and that was it. So I went back to school and um, continued working on Volkswagens. And then I told everybody, when I graduate from college, I'm going to get a job, and I'm going to stop working on cars. So I did. I, I sh Well, partly because of my mother. She shut me down. She's like, I can't hang with you having all these people here all the time, and all this noise, and all this filth, and I want you to be a doctor, a lawyer, you know. The yeah, your mom's typical. envisioning you as... as Russell, you're better than this. Like you need to well. be a professional. <laughs> you know, you know what I'm saying. Like mom's got her vi her plan for you. Yes, the typical Asian mom. Mm -hmm. You know, we're mm -hmm. all supposed to be doctors or lawyers. Yeah. My, my oldest brother went to UCLA. My second brother went to Stanford. I went to Long Beach City College, and then I went to Cal State Long Beach. Mother was very disappointed in me. <laughs> <laughs> so she shut me down. She's like, you can't work on cars here anymore. So. I teamed up with Paul Molina, a friend of mine, I told Roland, sorry, we can't do this right now. Um, I teamed up with Paul Molina. We worked out of his garage for a while, and uh, he ended up doing uh, sheet metal construction, air conditioning, ducting, and whatever, sheet metal stuff. So that didn't, that didn't happen. We were going to rent a shop together, and it didn't happen. So um, I took this shirt and tie job. I sold industrial welding supplies. And uh, that was horrible. And people kept calling me and telling me, look, I want you to work on my car. I'll pay you more. Flexible schedule. Whatever it requires, I want you to work on my car. And so I had a full-time job selling welding supplies. And I had a nighttime thing working on cars. My mom allowed me to do it again because I convinced her that's what I really wanted and I guess she wanted to have me at home where she knew I was safe. So right. she charged me rent, which was fine. <clears throat> so I paid the rent and worked on cars and had a full-time job that I So hated. she charged you rent for the garage at the house? Yes. What was the rent? It was 250 bucks, which I thought was too low, but I didn't say that. Right. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, okay, I could do that. And the reason she needed the money was uh, because she had uh, sold the restaurant and purchased some, some uh, rental properties. And uh, was having problems with the payments whenever there was a vacancy. So money was tight. So my my addition to it would help. And every time I flipped a car, which I bought and sold a lot of cars, she would put her hand out and say, hey, I need some of that. And um, I'll give it back to you later when you need it for something substantial. But you don't need any other stereo equipment. You don't need... <laughs> You don't Is that another subwoofer box? Yeah, you don't need all that. <laughs> so she would take a portion of all the all the proceeds yeah. and put it away from me. And so I had this job that I hated, and um, I had met uh, Judy, who became my wife. Mm -hmm. um, and she she said, um, "Why don't you quit your job and open a shop and do what you love?" And I said, "Well, um, I'm afraid to do that because it's a big risk." Yeah. And uh, she said, well, I think you can do it. And I think that happiness is more important than killing yourself the way you're doing these things. Yeah. So um, she, I, I found this shop in Long Beach. And um, it had a little tiny living quarters in the back. And it was in a dirt parking lot. And it was 1,400 square feet. And it had this little tiny apartment. And it was $1,450. And Judy was paying $450 rent where she was living. 
And when she saw that it had the um, living quarters, she said, if you want, I can move in with you and pay the same 450 that I'm paying where I'm at, and I can help you get your business going. And I thought, well, that's great. So uh, I quit my job, and we opened the shop. And William LaRoque, uh, he's a very good friend of mine, mm -hmm. he when I first went and looked at this shop and I was fearful, $1,450, I'm like, I don't know if I can do it. You know, I'm doing tune-ups. A full tune-up oil change and valve adjustment is $65. How am I going to make any money to pay this rent? And Willie's like, oh, it'll be all right. You'll be all right. It'll be all right. That's all he ever kept telling me is it'll be all right. And uh, he convinced me. I was like, maybe I could rent half of this building. He's like, no, nah, dude, you need the space. You're going to use it. You're definitely going to use it. So when I was in college, business marketing major, I had an instructor that told the class that small businesses that name themselves after the owner tend to stay small. And he says there's exceptions. You've got Oscar Mayer, you've got Ralph's grocery stores, whatever. Mm -hmm. But Roland had this license plate frame that said Old Speed on it that he and Burger had had made at the um, swap meet or something for his car. Mm -hmm. And he let his friend um, drive the car and he crashed it. Mm. So the license plate came off, the frame thing or whatever, this placard. And it was up on the wall in my shop, in the garage. And then when I decided, okay, we're gonna actually go into business now and not just be Russell's garage anymore, I remembered what that instructor said. And I was like, you know what? I don't wanna name it after me. I just wanna be old speed. What do you think about that, Roland? And he says, yeah, that's perfect. Let's do it. So Roland came with me and uh, took care of the dogs. Judy and I lived in the back and uh, it was a great life. We lived there for four years. I had to uh, work until midnight or one, get up at six, go back out in the garage, start working again. She was a full-time school teacher, yeah. she, so she was gone in the daytime. She'd come home from work. We would go down to the local Golden Star restaurant, and they knew us so well, they knew what we were going to order. That's We ate dinner there. <laughs> we ate dinner there every night. You know, you walk in the door, they go, oh, we'll get, your, we'll get your food ready. Yeah, and then go back home, She'd go inside, watch TV or whatever, and do her thing, and I'd go back out in the shop and work. I worked and worked and worked. It was like seven days a week, forever, um, felt like at least. And then um, Roland would take care of the dogs when Judy and I would want to go away for the weekend. We'd go to Las Vegas or Laughlin, take the weekends off. Um, I had a little pit bull and, uh, and a German Shepherd, both given to me. Everybody's always trying to give me something. Right. So John Dodds, Jai was his name, or is his name, his nickname. He used to hang out with uh, Sublime, mm -hmm. and uh, he's a surfer and um, Volkswagen guy, and he would come over with buses and roll and be like, another bus, I don't want to work on a bus. We, we hated buses. Yeah, buses we, were, buses, back in the day, buses were like the weird guys drove buses, and they weren't cool. And, and they, they weren't fast. Yeah, they were just a big old pickle loaf that was yes. just ugly. And, and they were hard to work on. Stinky. The wiring, <laughs> the wiring is difficult to get to. Yeah, yeah. And getting the rear brake drums off of some of them is very difficult. Yeah. And even getting the rear axle nuts off of them sometimes is difficult. So we hated buses. Nobody ever wanted to work on them, but we took them in every once in a while. And Jai was the one that twisted my arm to work on buses all the time because he loved them because he was a surfer. And the reason I brought up his name is because he gave me Molly. She was my little pit bull. And uh, he brought her over one day, and he says, hey, man, I need you to take this dog because I can't even take care of myself. And so anyways, I adapted the dog because I already had a shepherd. And then one night in the middle of the night, so Judy and I are living in the back of this warehouse, mm -hmm. and it's in an industrial area. And... Um, that place was fantastic, but horrible because when it rained just right and the wind was just right, it would soak our bed. And mm. uh, it was, we'd hear eerie sounds at night. And I'd, you know, even though I was only sleeping five or six hours a night, I'd be getting up in the middle of the night to check on what's, who's trying to steal what from where. Right. And one night, some guys were stealing stuff out in the yard. And I went out there with 38 and fired a couple shots and scared them off. And. <laughs> <laughs> I was scared and I was the one doing the shooting. And yeah. So but are, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, 
you're putting it all on the table. You've got a wife who's super supportive. She sees that you love doing this and she believes that you can be successful doing this. And she's like, I'll back you up. Let's go for this. And then, you know, you, you, you work in the small shop. At what point do you decide like, we, when do you start to get in? Cause, cause I knew you from when I first met you, which was like early 2000, 2001, like you already started to do the Porsche brake adapt adapting and all that stuff onto buses. So you, what got you to where you're going to like, you got into buses like lowering and doing that kind of stuff because there's a lot of, well, let me tell you about the, the 1991 thing that happened is the city of Long Beach kicked us out cause we were doing major <clears throat> auto repair in a, in a zone that was zoned for minor. And I'm like, well, you got Howell drilling right here. They're doing commercial. I mean, big equipment repair they're all grandfathered in so anyway city of long beach wanted to change the dynamics so they changed the zoning so judy and i had to buy a house and move the business at the same time mm. and mike walter had griffin's machine shop in paramount and next door to it was an empty warehouse five thousand square foot place and he uh he says hey don't don't become my competition but the building next door is available and uh, I think that might be a good spot for you. But it's 5,000 square feet. It's huge. So um, I had a good friend, Buck Goodrich, who um, was into off-roading. And uh, I said, hey, do you want to rent one-fourth of the shop with me? He's like, yeah, I want to do that. So he took the back one-fourth, and I took the, the forward section, and we shared the shop together. And he built sand rails. Not, this is not. Is this connected to the Buckshot company? No. Okay. No. His is extreme fabrication. Oh, okay. I know extreme. extreme I know extreme fabrication. Yeah. So he was building um, drive axles with U joints, and everybody else was doing nine thirties and type twos. Right. And um, he was you, doing Corvair style. No. Well, yeah, I guess it was because that's you know. how the late, late model Corvairs have U, double U joints on yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. So Buck rented that portion of the shop. Roland worked full time, and then we had. Uh, I've always been surrounded with a bunch of great guys. Um, back in the shop in Long Beach at the end of the driveway was tip top towing and they were towing Volkswagens in off the freeway that and they had, a tow yard, they had a tow yard there too like a storage yard yeah my Oof. first my first shop the one that Judy and I lived in at the end of the pathway it was mm -hmm. the end of the dirt road was a, a tow yard full of Volkswagens I mean full of all kinds of cars but like Carlos mine. Carlos the guy that owned it comes down and because I was always trying to buy something from him and he's like he comes over and he says I'm tired of dealing with 10 people I just want to deal with one person he says I'll make a deal with you you buy every air cool Volkswagen that I bring in off the freeway that I lean sale you buy them whether they're crashed burned or they just ran out of gas so I'm like okay so I have bought and sold probably over 800 Volkswagens because wow. I was flipping them and then Carlos was bringing them to me and a lot of them had ran out of gas. I mean, literally that's why they got pulled over there on the freeway. Cause they ran out of gas. Bro. <laughs> then they get impounded and then the person that owns the car can't afford to get it out of impound. Right. And then it gets lean sailed and then I pick it up for pennies and the ones that had bad registrations or couldn't, you know, was too expensive to put back onto the road we would dismantle and we would sell the floor pans to Kirk Duncan at Vintage Speedsters. And um, we would take, I don't know, we had so many, so many parts. It was but just. But you just had an avenue for everything. This guy bought these, those guys bought that, these guys bought core motors, these guys yes. bought. So we you... kept most of the engines because we were building engines, but Kevin at Trans West got almost all the transmission cores. And um, he was very instrumental in, in everybody was instrumental. Um, Gene Berg was instrumental. Did you know Gene? Did you know Gene much? Or you... I sold Gene a lot of DCNF carburetors. Like every time you got DCNFs, you knew the buyer, you knew who the buyer was. Yeah, and I would I would specifically buy DCNFs knowing that I could sell them to him. My my greatest experience at Pomona is he bought a set of DCNFs from me at my at my booth, and I was like, bro, Gene Berg just bought some carburetors <laughs> from me. Here's this guy with his pants all hiked up, middle of his chest, and he's got this fisherman hat on, and I'm like, or the the bucket hat, and I'm just like. I think that's Gene Berg. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, that's Gene Berg. And just bought a set of, and I was like, that was super, that was made my day. I hated DCNF, so I still do. <laughs> well, I, well, what's funny is when we talked not long ago, 
we talked about, uh, I was talking to Gary because you're building me that motor. And then Gary says, oh, yeah, tell Russell those DCNF 42s are just fine for that motor, man. He knows how good they are. <laughs> so, no, they are good, but I just don't like well, them. Again, it's a personal preference about stuff. But at this time that you've got old speed uh, and you've got that going, when does the bus lowering thing starts to happen? Because bus lowering started coming. I remember the first time at the 89 Jamboree, uh, it was 89 or 90, and I think it was 89, there was a black and white bus on Fuchs. And you just started seeing buses in the late in the, in the the late 80s, early 90s start getting lowered. And I remember seeing this one. I have a picture of it here in the garage somewhere I'll show you. And it was just black and white slammed on Fuchs, and it looked so good. And I was just like, man, that's so freaking rad. Like, how, how cool is a bus to be lowered? So when, because when, I know Bus Boy starts coming out with the Bus Boys kit, When's the first time you lower a bus? Because you've been kind of known for being heavy in the bus game. When When's the first time you lower a bus, and how do you do it? Well, just like being young and hating Volkswagens, period, I hated buses. <laughs> and so the reason that I got a single cab was because I needed a swap meet vehicle. Mm -hmm. So I bought a single cab. I don't remember what it where I got it, but I had a 1960 single cab, double treasure chest. It was great. And w that's the one that had the monster tack in it that you were talking about. So I put in a 2175 with 48s and a 130 cam, big heads, and um, lowered it by pulling out all the torsion bars. I didn't know how to do flip spindles then. And uh, Buck was doing the um, sand rail stuff. Mm -hmm. And we were converting, he was converting, we were building a lot of Bajas too. Me and Paul Molina were into the Baja scene. We there's a lot of history. It's hard to put it all into yeah, 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 yeah. one thing. So, um, Buck and I did the very first IRS conversion that Old Speed ever did mm -hmm. on that single cab. We put an IRS transmission on your onto cab? my single cab, and um, it it worked good, but it didn't work good because when you lower them with a stock IRS control arm. You have to push the IRS pivot socket so high up on the torsion tubes that uh, the toe in toe out is terrible. And I wore out a set of tires in about ten thousand miles. Oh wow! Rear tires. And I'm like, there's something wrong <clears throat> here. What's what's the problem? So, the more I looked at it, I realized that um, the pivot sockets were too high. So, and you were putting them in the, in the location that you thought was good for a beetle, for but lowering. not taking into consideration. No, for lowering. So, no, 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 I get that, but what I'm saying is you, you originally you were putting them in like where the stock, where the factory location was, not realizing when you lower it, it changes the geometry, and it would, on a lowered bus, change the change the tone. Yes, on. we were changing the geometry by pushing the pivot socket higher mm. to lower the vehicle, because oh, as it got went it, higher, got it, got, it, got, it, it got, got the camber correct. Mm -hmm. So I had to push the front of the control arm up to bring the camber in so that the wheels would sit straight. But then consequently, the tires wore out. And then we kept measuring the toe in. It's like, well, it's not off. It's not off. So we thought, well, why are the tires wearing out so badly? So we took the torsion bars out and we cycled the suspension and measured the toe in, toe out, and it changed by like an inch. Wow. So I'm like, well, we can't do that anymore. We got to get the pivot socket located correctly, but that means that we'll just do IRS conversions for stock height buses. So we did a whole bunch of stock height IRS conversions. Now, I know I'm not the first one to ever do a bus IRS conversion. It doesn't matter who's first. I just figured that, you know, I can make my own kit with um, weld-in pivot sockets. Everybody else is making And was he did, was sockets. he having the pre-made pivot sockets done because of doing sand cars? Or? Um, no, he was making all his own stuff. We just collaborated on how to do things. And I did my own thing. He did his own thing. And... Um, I went to Laser Innovations, which was Larry Rosevear. And uh, yeah, that's the son of Ron Rosevear, who was the was the the founder of uh, Auto House. Yeah, which I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, what's crazy is because when they close Auto House in like '84, those guys just go off into doing off-road stuff, working for parts places, all that kind of stuff. Which I'm going to get their story. But I had a great conversation with their with with their dad, who's in his 80s, and. I have a recorded interview with him, but not a formal podcast. And so I'm, I've, I reached out to him like two weeks ago. But again, in the VW world, there's so many layers of this begat that and then that begat that. And all these things were just before the next thing. And and, and all these guys that branch off from these other places. So, Are you saying that you have Larry's story also? No, oh. I, I spoke to his 
There's two sons. There's Larry Rosevere and there's another one, uh, Mark Rosevere. I think it's the other one. Well, and the reason I got to know Larry was because I was dismantling cars. Mm -hmm. And he wanted the IRS rear suspension arms and the double spring plates because he was building Baja Bugs. Mm. And um, He worked for McKenzie's? No, he had his own thing going on, Suspensions Unlimited. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, he had Suspensions Unlimited in Fullerton. And so since I was dismantling... I would bring him all the rear suspension stuff, stub axles, drive axles, and uh, control arms. And he only wanted the double IRS spring plates. So, I mean, that was fine. We had an abundance of everything. We didn't have enough space to keep it all was the problem. We yeah. had too much stuff. And uh, it was great because um, I had Pete Gonzalez and George Gonzalez, these guys that uh, were from the West Side that uh, were helping me. And we would have all these car parts take them apart, send, finish up uh, undercoating a floor pan, car bodies were being painted at Glow Auto, interiors were being done at Porphy's, I don't know if that name rings a bell, but there was a guy named Porphy worked out of his garage in Whittier, I think. There was another guy named Gil Tennyson that worked out of his garage in Cerritos. And um, consequently, we could have a different car for sale at every single swap meet. Now, are these cars that you're selling, are they slammed and wheels and tires and all stuff, or are they stockers? Yeah, no, usually it was lowered. With so wheels. you were doing, like you guys had a program, like, okay, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna make it cool, because this is the 80s and 90s, it's right. like, we're gonna slam it, we're gonna put wheels on it. So what was what was the recipe of like a old speed car that you would have there, that you'd be out there selling? Uh, 1776 with dual 40 Webers, mm -hmm. um, single quiet pack exhaust. It had to be kind of budget minded, Sure, sure. For me, for me yeah, to make, yeah. for me to make money, yeah, absolutely. On it. And a stock, a stock tranny, mm -hmm. and um, lowered in the rear with just readjusting, and lowered in the front by pulling torsion bars. And then the wheels. And the wheels were generally Porsche alloys, and JTEC Forge was um, drilling the brake drums and rotors for Porsche pattern, and making drop spindles. So eventually, I started buying the JTEC Forge spindles, and. Uh, Jim was a nice guy, and he eventually sold the JTEC Forge spindle production over to Andy at SoCal Imports, I think. Now, <clears throat> when's the first time? Because one of the big game changers in the VW world is narrowed beams. Yeah. When was the first time you saw narrow? I've been trying to track down the history of who's, where did the first narrowed beam come from? And then there's, I know you're one of the early guys in the bus game with like narrowing stuff and doing things like that. But who, when's the first time you run across? Cause I started looking at timelines and they had, they had lowered spindles in the late eighties. Yeah. They were just really expensive. And it's, it was like, bro, 30 minutes, I can knock the Leafs out and slam this bug. You really want to spend $400, you know, 400 bucks is a week's paycheck. You right. know what I mean? So with me, it was like the first time I, I, the reason my first bug that I built, the reason that it was sitting on, that it was sitting on uh, Fuchs or uh, what's it called? Uh, it was sitting on phone dials. The reason it was sitting on phone dials was because I put lowered spindles on. I wanted the best riding four wheel disc brake bug. I was making the Porsche bug, and this is 1991 to 93. And I went with phone dials because of the offset so that it wouldn't rub the tire. You know what I mean? And this is early nineties and I'm certain like J Tech or uh, I think it was, I don't know the name of the company. Uh, JT was the one that had the narrowed aluminum beams or the not narrowed, but just the aluminum beams everybody was drag racing with. So when's the first time you, cause th that's a game changer in the Volkswagen world is narrowed beams. It changed everything, wheels, all that <laughs> stuff. Cause the biggest issue with the Volkswagen, especially lowered was like what wheels you can only do the pizza cutters. You can only get the, you know, one thirty fives and stuff. When's the first time you run across a narrowed beam? Unfortunately, I can't really remember that. Um, I think that, I mean, I don't know who did the very first narrowing of a beam, but I think when I first saw how dramatic it looked and how good it looked was at a Pomona swap meet when it was a car that was a GFK car. Mm -hmm. And I believe it was Trail Duncan that narrowed that beam. And he just cut the shock towers off and narrowed it on the outside. I, I don't know how he did them, honestly. So... Then I started looking at it. Okay, I want to narrow beams, but if I'm gonna if I'm gonna do it, I want to put shocks on it. And uh, how can I put shocks onto a narrow beam? Mm -hmm. um, Mike Walter at Griffin's Machine Shop 
had been narrowing beams for Ron Loomis for the race cars. For race cars, yeah. For the race cars. And usually they'd have, what, no shocks or they'd just cut the car up? No, no, they, they already had a fiberglass front right. end on them. So yeah, they, so all the aprons cut out. Right, so it didn't matter. So they were just narrowing the center section, putting adjusters in them. So Mike had been doing those um, for Ron for a long time. I don't know. If, I, I think Ron did his own as well. Right. But at, there was times when it was easier just to call up Mike and order one mm -hmm. because, you know, Ron, Ron was busy doing his own thing, I'm sure as we all are. And so I told Mike, I hadn't ever narrowed a beam. And I told Mike, hey, I want you to build me a four inch narrowed beam because I'm gonna make it fit under a car with shocks. And uh, his first response was, no, oh, you can't do it, it won't fit. I said, I can make it fit. I just gotta, I gotta have the, the base to start with so right. I can see what I gotta modify. He says, no, it's not gonna work. <laughs> and. <laughs> And so Jake, Jake Eagleson was working for me at the time. He's like, Mike, just build him the beam. He'll make it work. Right. So I'm like, okay, cool. At least I'm getting some support there. So I just cut the shock. After Mike built me the narrowed beam, I cut the shock towers off. And I'm, I made F plates and made shock hoops to use a ball joint style shock instead of a kingpin style shock. The, well, there you the go. limiting factor was that the bolt's going to go in and hit the body. And then the tube of the tube of the shock the also. The tube of the shock would touch yeah. the body also. So I just cut the shock tubes off and um, put a ball joint style shock with a stud at the top instead of a, a bolt from the side. And that solved the fitment problem. And then we just always bought our drop spindles from JTEC. And then... Because now you can do the drop spindles, which add an inch going out. Yeah, half an inch. Half an inch. Well, but, one inch total. You're right. right. Yeah, but, then, but then now you can run fuchs, and they stay under under the lip. Right. You can even run a 195.50 and not rub. You right. know what I mean? So when do you start getting into... Because you started turning gears and started getting in like the 2000s. You were like, if you wanted bus stuff, like you're the guy. You started building the bus beams and all that stuff. I mean... Or, or, Bus suspension in general, when do you start going down the road of realizing like, hey, this is a market and everybody's, because you did Burger's bus, which was a really popular double cab. That was a cover car too. Yeah. Um, which, you know, it, it's back, you know, a guy that knows Burger bought it back. And so it's kind of back in the family type thing. The car is somewhat of a survivor. <clears throat> Kevin Blakely has that car. Kevin painted all of our cars. Kevin painted red, the red gear that Roland drove and he painted the yellow oval window that I drove and he painted... Uh, Burger's double cab and now Kevin has it back or I'm not sure if he painted the double cab Burger p painted also oh did he Burger painted his own square back his Carmen Ghia he had a lot of cars and you know some of those cars and, and and that's the thing too like when you get some cars that are published that have old speed stickers in the magazine how does that affect the business um, well it helped of course um, I think that as business progressed and my abilities progressed, everything meant you had to have higher quality mm -hmm. and higher safety. And I'm big on the safety. So brakes, brakes became my thing because Roland was going fast, but his cars wouldn't stop. Right. And so I'm like, I gotta, I gotta work on the brake systems. And he would always, he would always get me to give him a free brake adjustment by, um, saying, Hey, Test drive, drive the car. Test drive my car here, you know? And then I'd be like, I'd bring it back. The first thing I'd do is adjust the brakes. And he'd like give me a big smile. It's like, that's why I wanted you, <laughs> that's why I wanted you to drive it. Yeah. So um, I think Roland really propelled uh, the brake system into existence along with my single cab. Because, you know, the single cab you saw with the big monster mm -hmm. tech, it was lowered the old-fashioned way. Torsion bars were pulled out of it. And it had a, a faulty IRS system in it. And... Um, it wouldn't stop. So it had a big motor, but wouldn't stop. So it had the big fat spindle. I didn't know anything about buses. And 62 and down has the big fat shaft spindle, which is hard to put a brake right. kit onto. So 63 and up is uh, the same bearings as a Chevrolet or a Porsche. And um, I learned that while working at Chief Auto Parts because people would come in and, and ask for bearings for a Chevy Camaro. And it was the same part number as the bearings for a 64 to 79 VW bus. Really? Yes. And I learned that at an early age, and I stored it away in the memory banks. And I'm like, you know what? I can adapt some Chevy parts to fit on there, or I can adapt Porsche parts to fit on there. So I bought some Porsche 944 stuff, and it didn't fit on there because I had the 60 spindle. So I'm like, well, how am I going to fix this problem? 
so I wanted to put Porsche brakes on because I loved Porsche wheels. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> it's two birds with one stone, right? You get Porsche right. brakes, you don't have to re-drill anything. Exactly. So I wanted to put the Porsche brakes on. So I think I ended up using some early 911 hubs, and I had bought a lathe, and uh, I was able to bore the hub open. And my father worked at Oscar Mayer Meatpacking Plant, and he was in the mechanical supply department, and he had all these books on bearings and chains and belts and everything. And all the dimensions and he brought me home these books and he says here this will help you figure out your bearings and so um i found industrial cups and cones that would fit the spindle mm-hmm. and the hub if you mixed and matched so i probably was the first person to ever put a 944 brake set onto an early type 2 but not the first person to ever put an early break, a 944 brake set onto a 63 and later. Somebody else had already done that because one of my customers said, hey, I want some Porsche 944 brakes on my bus, mm-hmm. and uh, I know it's been done before. And I was like, yeah, I put, I put some on my 60 single cab, but actually the first ones were 911 with a thin rotor and the 911 caliper, and it didn't stop as good. And on that subject, we didn't have the internet. We couldn't just go figure out. <laughs> no, that's just go crazy. Out. Like you look at how easy it is now to get. If you want to Google like a bearing reference chart, you can pull that up in three seconds right now. Yeah. You didn't have to have a dad that worked at Oscar Mayer in the machining department right. that brought you this, you know, hundred dollar book of bearing stuff yes. that the company paid for. That you could cruise through and check. You know what I mean? Like. Because back then, if you wanted a catalog, you had to pay for a catalog. They weren't free. They didn't get. You know, the the world is. It's such a different place today with technology and access to information, which is the which was the big hurdle back then, which is why there was so much trial and error because it was just like, well, let's try this. I remember, you know, the first kit that I'd got from you when we first met was the race spacers for my 67, uh, uh, my 67 bull run bus. Spacers and, and brackets. You traded yeah. me a. Yeah. Yeah. Trade you like, today's value the transmission's probably worth like three thousand dollars <laughs> that i trade i had two of them there but this is the same this is the same porsche transmission that i bought a, an entire 65 911 for 400 bucks and i'm at pomona just chopping it up and cutting it selling the fenders and the gauges and and for me it was a basket case because around the lower rear window was like a little rust spot and i'm like oh yeah this thing's trashed it's got <laughs> rust like you know and it was a solid car i ended up selling the 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 body to somebody and i sold the fenders the hood i sold all the early 911 stuff for next to nothing and for me i was like well shoot i bought the car 400 bucks i've already made my money back what do i care here take this transaxle and i'll i trade you the porsche transmission for the bearing spaces and all stuff and then i got back (coughs) home i went straight to the wrecking yard and i bought to this day i bought Four brakes off a na9 944 all the four brakes calipers rotors everything took them home put them on the car i think i had to get some caliper modifications from you for the rear but put those on the bull run bus and to this day 20 24 years later that bull run bus still has the same junkyard brakes i'm like i put i i put new pads and i don't even think i rebuilt the rotor i mean i don't think i bit i mean i rebuilt the um caliper because i pulled them off the car didn't let it just bled them out and they're they're probably they're the second best brakes that i have compared next to the 944 turbo brakes that are on the the carbon cab but it's just like it it they work fantastic i don't i don't think the bus weighs enough to weigh to wear out a set of those pads you know what i mean yeah the 944 weighs over 3000 pounds so it was it was perfect for adaptation and it uses the same wheel bearings um it's just that the spindle shaft is shorter right so i had to make a bearing spacer that fit each side to spread it out to fit to the length of the bus spindle and then i started making the um, brackets with um larry at laser innovation mm-hmm. so larry rosevere had suspensions and limited but i think he got tired of building bajas and decided that everybody needed brackets and and things cut so he started laser innovations and sold suspensions unlimited i mean you'll have to ask larry about that if you never get him yeah on no I, I need to get him on the podcast because it, again it's all connected, right? That kid's cutting his teeth working at Auto House in the '80s at the me- in the mecca of the VW time, right. like 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 the, the the total hot spot of like what was cool and all that. And 
But lowering buses, <clears throat> like when, do, so you lowered your bus just kind of on a whim, but then like, when do you, did you, you narrow your own bus beams in the beginning? No, or what I do didn't. You do? I didn't. Um, the 944 brake thing really took off, mm -hmm. and that's where I really started to um, gain traction as far as popularity in the bus scene, because yeah. I, I had been primarily into the Beatle scene and um, didn't really care for buses. Yeah. And the bus crowd is definitely different. Like Real the different. Beatle, the Beatle crowd was very competitive and secretive, and um, it was all about racing and stuff like that in the early days. And racing was fun. I did my share of drag racing, um, mostly because Roland wanted to, not because I wanted to. I was more of an off-road guy. I loved going to Glamis. Drove my Baja to Glamis, beat it up for three or four days in the sand, and drove it back home. That's Now, you that's had a, a big ways. Type 4 powered car out at the sand dunes, did you? No. Oh, yeah, I did. I did. I had Fun, Fun Co. 5 with a 2840cc Type 4. Is that the car that's up on the rack? Yeah, it's up in the rafters. Right. I might have to end up with that Funko car from you. Yeah, I think I think it, it may go at some point. <laughs> I took the Type 4 out because I was tired of buying the race gas. And um, um, Judy didn't want the kids in uh, in the desert on quads or three She wanted wheelers. them in a cage. She wanted them in a cage. Yeah. So each of my children had a sand rail, and getting them <laughs> there was a challenge. So, so you had some pretty Mickey Mouse stuff set oh, up to man. go to the dunes. Oh yeah, it was it was like Sanford and Son. I had a, um, a, a sand rail on the roof and two on a trailer behind it. And, Good uh, grief! What you, yeah, what you have? You also had to have a forklift to get the things off when you got to the dunes. No, I had ramps that I built that uh, could pull of them on course. with the winch. You know, <laughs> with the winch. And you had to come along. <laughs> Yeah. In fact, the reason that that the reason the sand rail thing came about with being able to carry two on the trailer was because Mike Walter at Griffin's Machine Shop, who mm -hmm. um, was gracious enough to offer me the place next door. And uh, is that the place you're still at today? Yeah, I'm still there. And he's and still there. Actually, he's he's working with me now. Yeah. Because uh, we had a hostile landlord takeover and uh, the rent went way up. In fact, we were all getting evicted and then uh, we were allowed to stay, but the rent went way up. So Mike. Uh, moved all of his stuff into my place and we worked together so uh, Mike's a great guy and he um, went through kind of a bitter divorce and uh, he had old sand rail sitting there and uh, me and the guys convinced him that it was time to go back out in the desert and have some fun and one of his excuses for not going we just took away every excuse that he could right. come up with and one of his excuses was that he couldn't couldn't get it out there so I built a rack and put his on my trailer with mine and uh, made it to where we could get his out there. And uh, he's out in Glamis this weekend, actually. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So That's right. You know, and you it, guys would go to Glamis? <clears throat> yeah, we would go Glamis to Glamis. was closer for you guys than Dumont? I don't know. I've never been to Dumont. But really? I only go to Glamis. Dumont, Dumont is completely different than Glamis, but uh, they're like Dumont's big, tall, giant dunes, but Glamis goes forever. It's a lot of small dunes, but... Uh, yeah, I've been. I I have been to both. Um, I didn't get a lot of dune time when I was down at Glamis, but uh, it's definitely it's enormous. So if you want to test your Volkswagen stuff, take it off roading. That's yeah. that's the true test of it. Well, that's the you know when I I did a podcast with with Adam Wick and I said what's been the biggest game changer in the off roading world? He says suspension. The better the suspension, the faster you can go. Horsepower has never been a problem. Right. You know everybody can get anything to get a thousand horsepower, whatever the case is, but. It's been suspension, and when you look at like the new side by sides that are out, I mean, I've done thousand miles in Mexico in my in my side by sides, and those things are just like Fox shocks. They're, I mean, they're built to just soak up yeah everything. They're pretty amazing. Oh my gosh! But I think the prerequisite to owning that should be that you have to drive a, a swing axle <laughs> sand, sand rail first. Yeah, well, you, but it's funny because the kind of the retro thing comes back. So like, if you show up at the dunes in like a beam car, yeah. everyone's like, "Oh man, that's cool! What a cool classic!" Or you show up like in a Manx or something, and but but also you know with those cars back then, like a different car with limited suspension. You had to know how to drive because you're gonna kill yourself, break the car, or get there. I mean, when I first my first time going to the dunes, I had a Polaris Ranger, right? Like, which is like the, the, no travel, might as well be a Volkswagen. I mean, it's it's limited like that, top heavy, all the stuff. 
But I had a buddy of mine, I'd go up there and he just knew how to read the dunes and we'd slowly but surely we'd get to the top and get to the top and all of a sudden people were like, how'd you guys get those things up here? And it's like, it's been a long day, but we got here. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so you're you're right to the point where cutting your teeth on limited suspension and difficult things and learning actually how to drive the car, use the power band, those types of things make make a huge difference. Now, you've been in the location where you're at now for how long? Since, since 1991. That's Since 1991. Yeah. I've been doing this for 40 years. Since 18 years old, I'm 58 now, and I'm starting to feel it. And you've been, but you've been on the front end, like you really went down a rabbit hole with brakes and stuff like that, because you, you've really just been trying to come up with and what's your motivation to make it easily replaceable, the most common thing available? To like, like what's what's your motivation? Because you've you've tried a bunch of different stuff. Well, we started out, of course, with engines. Everybody was building engines, and and then of course Roland's car wouldn't stop, so I had to get into the brakes. And then I started seeing that the brakes and the suspension was a good avenue for business because. Um, for one, there was a lot of engine builders, and for two, engines, you're married to those things forever, and things go wrong with engines, mm -hmm. so why not just stick with something that's pretty bulletproof, and suspension and brakes is pretty darn bulletproof if done right, and um, I think that uh, the bus stuff came about when, I think that John Jones was very instrumental in a lot of the bus stuff coming out, because he was building buses and, and changing the look and doing... Um, doing dramatic things to them right right and and he was an inspiration to me and when i said that bus people and bug people are different <clears throat> the bug people are very competitive and they don't want to share secrets um nate from wagons west great guy he would he said yeah i got no secrets there's plenty of business for open all of book us. yeah open book john jones i could call him up and ask him hey how, how do you raise the steering box what do you do and uh he would tell me and um I didn't see that in the Volkswagen Beetle scene as shop owners sharing, right? Sharing how they do stuff because they're all trying to keep the customers yeah, just for close, them. Yeah, keeping it close to their own vest because keeping the customers right. But the um, the thing that I like about Nate was he's you know like he said there's business for all of us you know and there's no reason not to share the ideas. Yeah, if he's standing there in a warehouse, big old warehouse with all kind of t cutting edge equipment and he can't get it done fast enough, there's more yeah, than enough business more than for everyone. Yeah. And it, it, what's interesting, I was, ta I was talking to someone the other day, and I said, if you're going to lower a bus, you're you're talking, it's going to cost you at a minimum four or five grand, if not more, to lower a bus correctly. It can go up to 10, 10 to 12 grand to lower a bus to do a full beam, I mean, a full beam spindle to end to end with brakes and everything on it's going to be three grand 3500 bucks way more now. yeah maybe more you know what i mean it just depends to what degree if you're doing flip spindles draw spindles <laughs> welded spindles i mean there's so many different different things and you know and that's the thing between wheel and tire combinations there's nine different ways to skin that cat depending on how low you want to go because it's like it's not like you can just do okay let's just do a six inch welded spindle and then an adjustable beam because then you can't that six inches too low to adjust it higher if you want to, then it'll change your geometry the other way. So there's, there the, the funny part is the recipe of trying to figure out what works. And and I, I've talked to many people, you know, in, I, when I had, uh, I interviewed PK, that was at MP for a while, which they approached you and, and you guys were in talks when he was there, which is another interesting avenue that we'll go right, on, right? right. And, and, and one of the things I talked to him, because I, I kind of knew kind of inside baseball that, <laughs> those talks were happening, you know, talking to him off the air, talking to you off the air. And when he was there and, and, and I said, the Volkswagen world is so unique to every other world because, you know, with, with V8 engines, you've got these three combinations that really work well if they're Chevys and then these three and those three. And with the Volkswagen, it's like, well, you get a freaking graph chart where you've got 19 different engine combinations and every single engine builder has his own flavor. Like I like stroker, you know, small diameter piston, big stroke, and this guy likes that, and that guy likes this. Some of those things have kept the Volkswagen business really difficult to gauge, and it's a billion-dollar industry, you know, talking to the guys, you know, a few years back, talking to the guys from Flat 4 and things like that, and it's always like the, the recipe, like what's your recipe for the best, most reliable motor where you're going to get some power and it's like you've always got the vw guys like well I, you know i want 200 horsepower and daily driver and still get whatever mile to the gallon 
What do you think if you're going to build, like you're building Russell's Volkswagen? Let's start with what, what's your platform? What are you building for you? Well, that's such a wide open question. It is, but, I've done. <clears throat> but you get, now I'm limiting you. I'm putting you in a box. I, Russell, you I, can you got to have one car for the next five years. You've got to use it for all the stuff you want to do Volkswagen-wise. Build it, build it right now. Yeah, is it, is it bug? Is it bus? What are you building, a bug or a bus? I have a, well, I have a double cab right now. Okay, so you're going to build a double cab. I We're going to start with a double cab. I, okay, but I have a lot of projects. But I have a 65 double cab. Part of the problem with being a business owner is that I don't find the time to work on my own stuff. <laughs> no, I know, but we're, we're, I'm going to pigeonhole you now because we're going to get Russell's recipe. You're going to build your favorite double cab. How are you going to build? I, and I know this one, it's stock height. and It's been there forever. But you're, this is open blank. There's no sentimental value. You're going to build it for performance, reliability. You're going to drive it to Bill's show one crazy weekend. What, dri what drives me is performance and dependability and safety all in the same package. So what's your setup? But something that other people haven't done yet yeah. is what motivates me to make something new. And oftentimes I'll just shelve a project after it's done because it's too much work to, to do over and over. And it's not about money. Right. Um, so right now what I'm actually working on mostly in my head is some drive axles to be able to lift a bus higher and not have CV joint problems. So that's something that I'm kind of working on. For like lifted, for like off-road buses. Off-road buses, yeah. Now, if you're going to build a street, you're going to build a street double cab. What's your recipe for a street double cab? What's the lowering? What's the tranny? What's the motor? Well, the the front end should be ball joint because it rides much better than a King and Link. You, you know, I remember on the early days of VintageBus.com, Franklin's VW Works was up there doing ball joint ball joint narrowed beams like wave and i've been chasing franklin for a while we just haven't connected yet to do a podcast but i remember he was doing the ball joint beams now why does the ball joint ride better because they have less friction and um does the spindle swivel easier in the up and down travel yes well the the problem with the flipped spindle mm -hmm. everybody does flip spindles my my uh my double cab is flipped so there's a lot of so many different topics here to talk about. It gets a little. <laughs> but you're gonna build. But we're. I'm, I want to keep you on building your street well, performance double cap. Talk, What's the recipe? Let's talk about flip spindles for just a moment. Okay. Because just the other day, a guy asked me, "Can you build me some five inch lowered hybrid spindles?" And I said, I, "I won't do it." And he said, "But you have done it." I said, "Yeah, I have done it, but I won't do it because it changes the angles wrong when you move the spindle up that far and you're not following the kingpin axis." So I think three and a half inches is about the max that you can go on a hybrid before geometrically it starts to get wrong. So three and a half inches relocating, lowering the bus that way, which is on a standard flip spindle, like a reconfigured machine three, flip. It's three and a half inches. Three and a half inches. So a flip spindle, three and a half inches, adjustable beam to get you another inch if you want another inch, which won't change the steering geometry or, or the suspension geometry that bad where it'll start riding like crap. Right. So the reason I don't like flipped spindles, even though I build them, is that the original design of the spindle had two fiber bearings that mm -hmm. carried the load and made the spindle turn easily because it's got bearings. They're uh, like they're Bakelite. Right. It's style. like a fiber, fiber washer. Fiber washer, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what's supporting it. When you flip the spindle, you take away the load bearing surface from two to one and you make it steel on steel. So mm. you've you've made that spindle now self destruct every time you turn a wheel. So it's slowly just it's wearing slowly the metal. It's slowly just wearing out. itself out because it's steel on steel now. Instead of two fiber washers carrying the load, it's now one area of the spindle steel on steel. So on a ball joint on a ball joint uh, suspension, what bit, what <coughs> spindle are you using? We make our own. We, well, we, t we start with a bay window spindle. So you take a bay window spindle, you face it. No, we take a bay window spindle, we cut it into three pieces, and then we re-weld it back together in a lowered configuration. And I changed the geometry on them a little bit so that they handle better at high speeds because the Volkswagen was really designed to go 60, 65, right. and the bus. Can you retrofit an existing beam to ball joint? Like, could you yeah. take? Could I take my beam and make it a ball joint beam? 
you couldn't take your particular bus beam and turn it into a ball joint beam. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could. It'd be something fancy. Well, something I mean, like, what do you have to do? You start with a bay window front suspension beam. Okay. So you have... Because the diameter of the tube is different. Yes. And, okay. the, and the bearing, the needle bearing is different. Right. So what I like to do is, and my whole business model has always been genuine Volkswagen parts. Mm -hmm. It will modify the genuine part. So that's why I'm not a fan of urethane bushings. I'm not a fan of Delrin sleeve bushings. And uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of aftermarket stuff, period. I like genuine Volkswagen parts. So we're the only shop, not the only shop, but we're probably one of the only shops that go to all the effort of cutting up genuine Volkswagen front ends and putting them back together with all the bearings in the same position where they were originally. And uh, it's a lot of work. And how, and so if you're going to do a, if you're going to do a ball joint beam for an early bus, for an early bus. So you cut the tubes out of the, out of the end plates mm -hmm. and then you narrow it a little bit on each side of center. So do you use an original yeah, we use ball, joint, original, or, ball joint beam? Original ball joint beam with original needle bearings. And you can narrow it how far? We can narrow them five inches. Oh, wow. And then we also make narrowed front control arms uh, an inch per side. For So we cut the arm off where the ball joint attaches. Similar to how you do for the Type 3. Similar to the Type 3. Mm -hmm. And then um, so you could get seven inches narrowed with a uh, five-inch beam and two-inch arms. And then the difference in ride quality, like if I were to drive a ball joint lowered beam, like one that you built versus mine lowered the same amount, what is, is it a noticeable difference in driving? Yes, by far. Noticeable what is the difference. biggest noticeable difference? Is it the, the sit, smoothness? Is it the sit still steering when you're trying to park the that car? Also a little bit of that, but not, not so much that yeah. it's more just the smoothness going down the road. Um, however, I have a customer, um, that has a ball joint beam mm -hmm. and he has a 944 hybrid beam and i made both of them for for listeners that don't understand what a hybrid beam is explain what a hybrid beam or i guess it would be a spindle right hybrid it's spindle. a hybrid spindle so what i don't like about the flip <clears throat> spindle like i said is the one load bearing surface and steel on steel contact mm -hmm. so to combat that we cut off the spindle point and weld on a, a porsche 944 spindle point and the first ones that i made i overlapped them and they were wider by half an inch per side and they steered differently so i went back and redesigned how i do that and made them zero offset and they steer like stock so then you get the three and a half inch lowered with the ride quality with the two load bearing bearings so that's the most ideal way to do a kingpin link pin is with the hybrid spindle not so a hybrid spindle. spindle is basically relocating. It's a the welded spindle, spindle. Right. You're relocating where the wheel attaches instead of relocating the spindle the, configuration. The spindle configuration right? yeah, yeah. So it'll still, so it'll steer much nicer plus. <clears throat> right. But so you I, don't, you don't like doing those. I you prefer to do, if somebody says, Russell, lower my bus, whatever you think the best, I you're going to go ball joint. Window. I prefer a ball joint bay window because of the ride quality. But they do also wear tires out faster because the ball, joint does? the ball joint front end wears tires out faster. And that's because I changed the spindle point geometry mm -hmm. for high speed quality. And tires are relatively cheap. So uh, that's a sacrifice. Right. So, and then trans, what do you, and then how are you lowering the rear? I prefer swing axle. I know oh, IRS, yes, I know IRS is something that I have done for years and touted as being great, but I touted it as being great for stock height. Mm -hmm. So for lowered, I prefer swing axle because it's simple. I have a bolt-on drop plate set that lowers the rear four inches without changing the spring plate angle. And the spring plate angle is important because of hanging downhill, it rides smoother when you hit a bump if the spring plate's hanging downhill. If you do a, the old conventional style busboys kit where you notch out the spring plate, mm -hmm. uh, now your spring plate's parallel to the ground. And when you hit a bump, it takes more energy for that suspension to actually travel. So the drop plate um, serves two, two purposes. It allows you to lower it with a smooth ride and it allows you to install a swing axle, but a beetle tranny without modifying the length of the axle tube. You can take a stock 67 or 68 or type three axle tube and bolt it right into a bus. Whereas in the old days, 
we had to take the axle tubes and lengthen them right. and put short axle castings on them. Right. You had to do that whole, it was, again, it was a combination of short axle casting, the long axle tube, and then extend the actual extend, long axle. And actually extending the tube <clears> as well. <throat> right. So um, the lowering plate, best product I ever made. But you know what's so crazy about the lowering plate? It's like so simple to think up. But everybody thought, I got to make it like a beetle, right? That's what they went right in their head. They thought, yeah, all, all you had to do, I mean, the, the labor involved in cutting the torsion plate or the, cut the spring plates, all that stuff, it's less just to make the plates. Right, right. But and, and what's amazing is no one looked at it and thought, wait a second, let me put a, be-. they didn't, mo- like, that's, that's what's so crazy about the VW world, right? Like, everybody just gets on a tangent where they're just going down this road. And they keep saying, beetle, bus, beetle, bus. I'm going to make it like the beetle. And just that relocation plate of leaving the stock undrilled, uncircular, uh, without the notch in it, spring plate there, and then just putting the step-up plate, it does two things. Because I think the, a bus boy lowering kit, having suspension in the ground, it just drops it like three inches or three and a half in the back. And then you get four with the drop plate. Yeah, but you can get three and a half by readjusting it. So no, no, no. right. But then again, now you have less travel. So you've got less travel and you've also, I've seen this debate back and forth where people argue about, you know, when you clock that spring from that stock location where, where it's pointed downhill, that, that spring plate, when you just relocate it, you've now lessened the amount of tension on that bar and you have actually less spring pressure until you the spring pressure would be the same theoretically but you're going to have so much less travel you you never get to the point where it's designed because i don't think it's designed to go off the first bump it's going to be gradual with the yeah but there's not the tension but there isn't preload on your spring plate on a bus when it's sitting on the ground it's not preloaded against that lower stop right in factory form like if you had a stock bus sitting here it's not touching on that lower perch. Yeah, when it's fully rested. So it's not preloaded. However, when you have the but angle... But a beetle is. Actually, most of those probably are... Yeah, they, they are. They are, because when you pop it off, it makes that... That's the first time you lower a bug, you hear that giant thud when you pow, pow. <laughs> yeah, but, but when it's sitting on its own weight, it's not it's always correct. resting on there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But the reason that drop plate works so well is because since the spring plate angle is hanging down and you hit something here... It's it has it way it has leverage against it, but when it's hitting here and you're you're hitting the bump, it, it does it hops over the bumps, so that's why I think that draw plate rides so well. Um, that became out of necessity. That wasn't like some brainstorm I had that oh I'm going to make the rear ride better by doing this. It happened because uh, Rancho and Transwest said hey we're out of short axle castings, so if you want to you if you want to keep lowering these buses, you got to come up with some axle castings. And I'm like, well, I'm not coming up with axle castings. I got to come up <laughs> right. with a way to use what we have, which is right. long axle castings. <clears throat> so that that was the necessity factor there. And the same with the brakes. That all came out because of necessity. And then the narrowing of bus beams. Um, people started asking me, "Hey, can you can you do them?" And I'm like, uh, "That's a lot of work. I I don't know if I can do that economically." And then um, I started thinking about narrowing the front control arms instead. And I you know, then of course comes liability, you know, well, you know, what everything's I've, about liability. Well, what I've seen when I was, used to search the archives of, uh, vintage bus.com, some people actually took the lower a arm off of a three fifty six and welded it to the frame rails of a bus to try to get, to try to adapt like, or even nine eleven or nine fourteen to take that single arm. And Franklin did one, um, where you have, it, it's just got the single shock with the arm that goes in, in the, uh, uh, whatever it's called, uh, it goes in the top of the shock tire, it goes into the body because it's kind of a unibody design, but they'd weld the lower A-arm onto the frame rails and then bolt that up through the body, and that was one of the ways that they would do that. So, was, it, I mean, I've seen a lot of different ways people have come up with trying to lower a bus, and then you've got the A-arm suspensions for the bus. There's the guys in Red 9 Design in the UK that make it, and there's also the guys in Brazil that make the arm set up. But the problem with the whole bus is you have limited travel underneath that wheel arc, you know, and then you have to start tubbing it and then you tub it, it pushes the seat up and it's, it's a whole thing, you know, I've also based my whole design <clears throat> off of modifications that are reversible. Right. Cause I don't really like the idea of, um, fender tubs and cutting things up to where it's going to be so much work to reverse later mm-hmm. in case people want to return it back to stock. Right. Not that I ever intend to return any of them back to stock, but 
you know, somebody might. Well, yeah, I don't. I, my my bull run bus is now tubbed because we did the hydraulic suspension in it. But the, my double cab is not tubbed, and yeah. you know, I, I I drive the crap out of that. Of course, it's not laying on the ground slammed like you know some of the cool kids are doing. But yeah. I'm I'm okay with. <laughs> yeah, I'm okay with it. Other than maybe you got me thinking about a ball joint beam at this point now, just because. You know, I, I like a little smoother ride. I know George has his six inch welded, his six inch welded spindles. What we did that was just interesting is I put a, I put a GoPro camera underneath the fender well and I drove my stock bus, I drove my double cab and I drove his bus. I drove them all down the same loop so you could see the difference in the suspension and the, some of the geometry and stuff. So George is working on a video for that right now. But I did the footage where you can see and what was interesting is when I did that footage I could see that my shock bushing was blown out on the bus as the shock was going up and down you could just see the the yeah, you could see it moving yeah but it was it was pretty it'll be pretty neat to take the three if you could do the three comparison which is like a flip spindle a welded spindle and then stock suspension just to see because what I wanted to see was the difference of the arm angle right like and how that because obviously the arm angle is going to affect the steering as well and one thing about my bus is when you're parking that thing, then you're sitting low. It's like, it, and you're got big wide tires in the front. It's a little bit of work to kind of do that, which I've actually seen some guys do electric power steering. Yeah, I've seen that. In but it's just a huge ugly module. You know what I mean? Yes. At least the one that I've seen. A guy went to the wrecking yard and got it, but. Uh, um, but I drove one that had it in there, and it's not in the way. Like when I first saw it. Right, how, it's, it's not where your feet, where your legs are. Yeah, it, it didn't matter. After I sat down and it was like, wow, this actually works really well. How did it feel? I mean, it felt great. <laughs> it's some guy up in my area that put it in, uh, he put in all Tesla drivetrain into, and made an electric bus. And then he put this electric power steering in it and stuff. And Well, yeah, because the weight, it's got to be incredible yeah. because of the batteries. Yeah, he came to me for brakes and then he brought this thing over later. And I was like, wow, this thing's pretty impressive. So you got to drive it? Yeah, I got to drive it. All right, so what's your take on that? Um... It's weird because it's silent and uh, it doesn't feel like a Volkswagen. Yeah. So personally, I don't like it. Doesn't have the little vibrations no. and, and the little, the little, the visceral feel of driving. Because no. I've thought of that, you know, I, I, you know, obviously with George being a business, I keep thinking like, man, if you find your niche, you know, because you've got that thing where, you know, Michael over at DubFab, we've had conversations and I'm like, Mike, your menu's too big, bro. Your menu's too big bring it down to five parts and pieces, make a bunch of inventory and just supply that. I know you, cause he's a brainstorm. You know, a lot of these VW guys are brainstorm guys. They just keep going and keep going and keep, Oh, here's my new thing I'm working on. And it's like, shrink down the menu, focus on the five things. Cause you, you when you look at successful restaurants, right? You go to cafe real, you go to these, these new style restaurants where it's like, they got a real limited menu. They get you through, they deliver it quick and, it, and the quality is consistent. And it's because, They've limited their range, and then you go to like Claim Digger, Cheesecake Factory, and the menu's forty six pages, and you're like, I don't even know what I want to eat at this point, you know. So I'm guilty too. I do it all <clears throat> again. And, and you, but going back to my advice to George, is I just said, look, to be successful in a business, if you have a real limited pull, and I, I said, I think the electric thing, man, is it could be huge, or it could be huge if you just did. What I think is another thing that could be a great opportunity that, that people miss out on is like Subaru conversions. What's your thought on that? Have you driven some Subi, some Subi powered stuff? I've ridden in Subaru powered sand rail. And oh, yeah, I, ha I had one of those and incredible. I, I love it. I it was loved incredible. it. You know why I loved it? Because I'd wring its neck for an hour. I'd come back and park it and I'm not leaking oil. I'm not I'm not doing any maintenance other than one time I, I, fly, I fried a clutch on one, yeah. you know? But I think it's it's one of those natural progressions that if, if people made the adaptation really plug and play, you know? And unfortunately in our industry, there's no big factories doing this stuff. It's one of these deals where, you know, it, it's every guy in his garage doing something. And that's been kind of the thing when I talked to PK and we were talking about the VW industry as a whole, I said, you've got all these guys, the Bergs, the Russell Ludwigs, like all these people that are really smart, that this is their life. They spend their time doing this, but it's like, they don't have the resources to say, hey, let's just make a drop bus spindle. Let's go make a lowered spindle from the, you know, f f we'll get it manufactured in China where all the foundries are. We'll have it done and we'll make, you know, like Belltech, but for buses, you know. And it's like if one of these guys like Belltech were getting the VW game, they... <laughs> Unfortunately, it is the future because I remember when the Japanese cars first came out, everyone thought they were terrible. Now everyone, I mean, I'm talking late 60s, yeah. you know, and now they're the, the standard. 
Yeah. And the same thing's happening with the stuff being manufactured in China. Originally, it was bad. And uh, now it's gotten pretty darn good. So. Now, one of the things I want to touch on is you had an opportunity. You've done some stuff for... Uh, like people that have collections of cars, like they'll, 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 they'll find cars they want, but they bring them to you. Like you, are you, are you okay to talk about any of those people or you try to keep that a little low key? Um, I, I mean, I suppose I can talk, I've been very blessed to have been able to work for quite a few celebrities. And, and who, uh, who, so who's, who's some of the stuff, some of the cars that you've worked on? I've worked on, uh, we did a full restoration for, uh, Tom Hanks. Mm-hmm. We've and what done, did he? Oh, so what did he have? He had a 1979 convertible Beetle that his wife, it was her first car, mm -hmm. and he had it stored away, and he wanted to restore it for her for her birthday. Oh, nice! And um, you know, of course, I didn't meet him. There was a middleman involved that brought it over and orchestrated everything. But like we did, you did we the did, full job. We did the full job. Well, no, I mean, we didn't do the interior and the paint, right. but we were involved. And um, and then we've done a lot of work for Jerry Seinfeld, mm -hmm. and we've done a lot of work for Fluffy Iglesias, and we've done quite a quite a bit of work for Ewan McGregor, and um, and there's there's a few others here and there, um, and all that's been a blessing. Every one of them's been very kind to me, yeah. And, uh, and that's important to note because you know sometimes people feel like celebrities are this or that, or I don't know how people view them, but at the end of the day, they're just nice guys. They're just, they're just nice guys like, like all of us. So. Yeah, I like to say that I put my pants on one leg at a time as well. <laughs> you know, I just, the difference is I just make podcasts every week. And so, yeah. but yeah, it's, it's always, it's always interesting in this business. Did you think 40 years ago you'd still be doing this? No. Uh, well, I, yeah. Did I you did. think it was, <laughs> was there any point in the time that you've been in the business where you thought this is coming to an end? This is going to be the death of Volkswagens. This is going to be the. No, I don't think I've ever felt like it would end. Um, but I have told myself years ago that when I grow tired of it, I'm going to quit. Yeah. And um, I don't know that I'll ever be able to do that because it's always been interesting because it keeps evolving. Yeah. It's amazing how ideas keep on evolving. And you would think that you can't make them go any faster. You can't make them stop any better. You can't make them ride any better. You know, because everybody's already done all this stuff. It's like people get stuck sometimes on who did what first. Right. I don't think it matters who did what first. I think it matters then who can do it better. Well, that's the thing, right? There's a lot of people that start off with there's people in the business that all they do is just steal everyone else's idea right. and then remanufacture it to an unbelievably low quality. Right. And then the, the saddest part about that, the thing that bums me out about that is people will, people will go buy parts. They'll be like, wow, stuff's really expensive. And then they'll stumble onto somebody's website and be like, wow, his stuff's super cheap. And it looks like, you know, I can get a good deal at this stuff. And then they get, scared out of the scene because they bought a bunch of garbage yeah. and they've, or they had a failure or even worse, hopefully someone doesn't get in a, in a cause I've seen some sketchy stuff oh, manufactured so out there. So have I. You know, you, you, you brought up, uh, I want to just step back to one other thing. You brought up Michael at, um, dub fab. fab having too many things going on at one time. I'm guilty. I, I had, I was, doing I, know. <laughs> blow, I was doing blow through turbos, draw through turbos and I've tinkered with fuel injection and I do, spindles and and uh for type one type two type three and i'm just too spread out so eventually i started pulling back on the engine stuff so that i could concentrate more on suspension drivetrain and brakes and i still have ideas that i want to explore with all that and um i think it's just the nature of who we are like michael is a thinker and yeah. he and i bounce ideas off each other all the time and and the guy that I'm also very impressed with uh, is Brian at Type E Motorsports. Yeah. He, he's... When you said the Chevy bearings, I started thinking about him because he comes from a rock crawling background. Yeah. Meanwhile, he's in the middle of nowhere in South Dakota. So right. he's kind of coming up with his own stuff and he's a fabricator by nature. You know what I mean? Right. And we share ideas. Yeah. We all share ideas with each other and we learn from each other. And that's the beauty of it. Yeah. It, it, well, the, the, you know, his easy stop bus kit, super inexpensive to get. You buy your own parts and pieces. And when I have other cars, like I have my Corvair and stuff like that, when I want a disc brake kit for that, I have to go to Scarebird. I buy a bracket and they send me a list of the parts to buy. 
Well, you know, I built my own drop spindles and put Willwoods all the way around on my Corvair. I know, so. I know. You you have a, you're an early Corvair guy. I'm a I'm a LM guy. I'm a late model guy. The baby Camaro, baby Riviera. That's the one that I drive. So, uh, but I love the I love the late model Corvairs. <clears throat> and what's funny is I think Corvairs were built. Obviously, the biggest auto manufacturer in the world was getting into the air cold market, and they really did a lot of research. and And I, I actually have an issue of excellence where they Porsche had bought a 59 Corvair to take the six cylinder, put it in the back of 356 so they could do testing for weight differences with a flat six in the back, you know. And, you know, what was spurred by Volkswagen was then copied by General Motors and GM doing everything that they did. I mean, those motors are overkill for a Corvair. You want to talk about heavy duty bottom ends. They've got really, really heavy duty bottom ends. But again, when you're trying to build something in a, in a tight package, you're limited on exhaust runners and stuff like that which is sometimes the achilles heel that you talk to the type one engine guys is the problem with the type fours the exhaust runner is not long enough it makes too hard of a 90 and then you go online and i just sent a message to udo becker trying to get him on the podcast type four guy builds circuit race type four motors with type one heads 2.6 liter 260 horsepower naturally aspirated you know running on on a race circuit all day and i'm thinking Okay, I got to find out what the deal is over here. Because some of these guys, <clears throat> everybody, and I think maybe it's the way that the, the U.S. does it, right? Because when when I had Greg Aronson on, who was with you Fat. know Fat Performance Forever, and we talked about the evolution of what they call the tuna boat motors, the Type 4 motors, because they were like boat anchors, basically. You know, it, it, it came from, obviously bigger displacement, heavier duty, dealing with the off-road, but then they reached a limitation with that where it couldn't do anything more. And in Europe, because it's OEM, they get away with using it with their laws and guidelines by using the Type 4. So they had they were forced to use the Type 4 and evolve with that because they can't get away with all the aftermarket stuff that we do here in the States. And so I'm often, uh, you know, I've got my 2270 motor that's in that, which is like a slip in big bore motor in the tight. I used to have a 2.6 in the double cab, and now I put the 2270 back in there. I'm going to re ring it, have the heads gone through, and I'm going to turbo it. And I want to, I want to do a turbo. I want 10 pounds of boost, no more. Seven, run around seven pounds of boost with a max of 10, and should put it at about 200 horsepower. That's been dynoed. That motor's been dynoed on, on the rollers at 137 horse. I should be able to get. 65 horsepower by turboing it oh for sure but but i i don't want i'm not trying to drag race it i want a turbo on it so it can be like man this thing's just feather the gas and just you know because i did i did the power tour with it this year and stuff like that and i think sometimes people look at stuff and 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 depending on if it's racing technology they'll look at something they're not going to waste a bunch of time because if there's a better technology here they're just going over there you know and i think there's guys like you that look at stuff and say I think you could make that work, you know, and you put some time, effort, and energy in it. And it, and it's shown through a ton of stuff that you've done, you know, and, and honestly, we haven't even scratched the surface into the detail stuff. Cause, cause I think we, we need to come back and just do one podcast about your experience with the street racing scene back in the, I wasn't 80s. a big street racer though. Roland did all that. I was, but I mean, you were there. I, I went occasionally. Mm -hmm. I didn't go very often. I never actually personally did drove, you, but did you build any cars for these guys? I helped. Yeah. Yeah, but I didn't. Um, I didn't drive at the so-called street races, other than like Santa Fe and Delamo. But that was at a time period where the cops weren't showing up, and uh, I was real concerned with making sure that I made it through school and and uh, did all the right things. So I wasn't gonna get out there. But did you ever go out and spectate? Oh yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. So back in those days, w was it craziness at the street races? Yeah, like Florence and Maine, you'd have guys doing wheelies down the. I mean, these were busy streets too. It was crazy. I like the oh, so it wasn't like two in the morning. Like these guys are doing this stuff at eight o'clock. No, no, it was, it was, yeah, no, it was eight o'clock, nine o'clock, midnight, two. I remember we were out somewhere in in uh, L.A. somewhere, and one of our buddies broke down, Paul and uh, Daryl, and uh, we had to get home. You know, we always had to tow each other home somehow. And one of these fools went into a neighborhood and stole somebody's garden hose and used it for a tow rope. That's how we got home. And but but you know, and there was also uh there was a guy that was killed at the street races. You talk about oh, what was his name Spoke? Spoke? Yeah. Was he was he killed at the street races? 
I don't think he was killed at the street races. No, he was test driving somebody's car, I believe, and, oh. and hit a truck. Um, I saw him. Was he a VW racer? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, he he was uh, big time with uh, Dave Kaywell, I believe. Because I'd love to get stuff. the story on that on, on that in of itself. Because that dude had some he had some street history, right? Being oh. a, being a racer on the street. Because yeah, when you when you'd see these races out there, I mean, were these like I had heard stories of like there's like drug dealers that are betting on other dudes, and there's big money going down in these races, and yeah, it's there like used to be, and and, and it get a pretty tense situation in some of those in some of those things. I mean, I see right now if you go on YouTube and you look at mini bike races, I mean they're 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 out there racing mini bikes, bro. I know on on nitro <laughs> stuff like that. I mean, it's just crazy. It's crazy what these guys will do, but. You know, that that whole thing, I think Jack Sacchetti's another guy that I might want to just, I, I want to assemble a couple guys that were really out there in that street racing scene because that's what he said. When, when one of his friends died street racing, that's when he kind of took it to the track after that. You know what I mean? It was just, it, the, the, the street scene started to get a little too hairy, you know? So I'm interested in, in some of that aspect of that story. But where do you see... Where do you see the VW industry now? Because it was it was a few years ago when there was change of guard at MP and they were talking to you about maybe trying to buy buy you and have you come on for development side of stuff. Yeah, um, that kind of brings it back to the the copying thing, mm -hmm. which is important. I'm not opposed to copying. Everybody's got to copy everybody on some level because we're dealing with the same car that's been around for you know, decades, right, right? Right. There's only so many different ways you can modify these things. And what I'm disappointed in is that if you're going to copy something, copy it and make an improvement to it. Yeah. Don't copy it and make it worse. Don't just do it economically and make it cheaper and then rip people off. So I think that um, Vintage V Dubs is a good example of that because he's copied everything that everybody's made mm -hmm. and he may have a few of his own good ideas and i think that he should bring his quality level up um we actually get a lot of business from people that have purchased things from him and they're dissatisfied and um safety is a concern well the I, I think part of the issue is unfortunately some of the vw people are just so focused on saving a dollar and their attitude is like, they'll justify it. It's like, well, that can't be that bad. I mean, that guy's building it and he's selling it. And people are, you know, like there could be a market for it. But I think when you're talking suspension stuff, I mean, I've seen some of the, some of the bus horseshoe plates for the late model base. I had a buddy of mine bought a set of those, never drove his car, put them on. I don't even think there's a motor in the car. I had the car sitting on the lowered plates and then they bent just sitting, just sitting there. They just bent in place. And I'm thinking imagine you're like in that car with your family driving somewhere and all of a sudden something just gives way. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's downright scary. Well, there, I mean, there's, <clears throat> there's really a lot of liability on it. And the problem is the, my biggest bummer of it is the same, the same feeling I get when I see the Brazilian buses that people think they're buying like nice buses because they get in the hobby because they want to be in the hobby. And the problem is they get soured by a rotten experience. Like, they bought a they bought a car from and listen if you're buying a car from Brazil just know it's been Brazilian and that means there's a little sprinkle of this a little sprinkle of that a little goop over here and some paint and some bondo and some chicken wire like that's just what they do in Brazil listen to no shame that's just that's just their game right? right but when you buy it and you get it home and you start looking at it like oh this is weird that's different like look you got a bus you got a bus at a discount enjoy your bus at a discount don't get too hung up on the details just enjoy it you know what i mean because a lot of people think they've got in their head they've got they've got 23 window brain and they've got brazilian bus money you know what i mean and they still think they bought a 23 window and i just get bummed out if people get soured on the experience you know because i think it's something where you know i love this hobby because of the people in this hobby and there's been lots of people that came into the hobby that were driven by money and they usually don't last long you know what i mean right and they usually start out with a bang and end in a fizzle because it's a small it's like vegas i describe vegas as a big city but it's a small town and if you're if you're known here that you're no good it catches up to you quick and yeah. you won't you won't last too long but 
Yeah, it's it, it bums me out because I like to see people get good things, and then by the time they come see you, they've already spent a bunch of good money on bad stuff, and it, e- it hurts even more to pay the price. Yeah, <laughs> well, we seldom we seldom advertise um, anything. I put a few things here and there on Instagram, just like product once in a while, but I don't have a website. Yeah, and we don't have any advertising in any magazines, and uh, people find out about us through word of mouth, which is the best, and. Um, Yes, I people find me because they've spent money elsewhere and they're dissatisfied with the quality and the service. And I, and and you have no shortage of work. I no, mean, you're no. never like, oh man, where's all the business at? Like, no, that's I don't want to advertise because I couldn't handle anymore. Right, we don't have the manpower for it. I mean, that's got to say something for you, right? You don't advertise, and you've been in business forty years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and we had a very long um, wait list uh, for forever. We were eight, six, eight months behind. And, um, you know, earlier I talked about um, Judy, my wife, moving into the shop with me. And yeah. and she virtually trusted me so much that she handed me her paychecks. And uh, she just never asked me about money. She just let me deal with it. And um, unfortunately, in 2016, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. Yeah. In 2018, she passed away, and uh, I really struggled for a long time. I, well, I remember seeing you shortly after. It was like a, you were like a different dude altogether. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. it's a difficult thing to, to, to experience losing someone that you've been that's been there for you because right. your whole life you're building this process of like we're going to get to this point. And then we're going to enjoy our life. Right now we're working hard. We're going to sit high by as we pass each other in the halls and raising our kids and doing all this stuff. And then, you know, unfortunately, life throws you a curveball. So that's when I really fell down in business. And uh, luckily the guys at the shop uh, held it together and and, uh, took care of things. And I have a great group of friends and a a great group of guys that that I work with and uh, they kept it together and now we're catching up on the on the backlog and um, I'm happy to say that I have a wonderful woman in my life and uh, she and I get along great and um, I have to you know thank God that through that darkness uh, he helped me learn that I can still love yeah well, you know, it's interesting, your experience, and I've got, we talked about my friend Chris Cox who passed away, and, and and it's like, it's the sourness of life, right? Like he, well, when I look at his story and I think like, man, I, I'm, I'm helping his widow just get, sell a bunch of parts and all that kind of stuff, and it's had me, it's made me have a conversation with my wife, and I said, listen, if so, and my wife is like, like, like your Judy was to you, you know what I mean? She's my everything, and I said, if something happens to me, I don't want you to be unhappy because we're meant, we're meant to be together with people. We're meant to have companionship. And I thought, and it create what's funny is it creates contention on the other side of a family. Like, well, Hey, there's only one mom. She can't be replaced or there's only one dad or, you know, but I thought of the mature, the mature thought of it for me was like, I want, I love you so much. I want you to be happy. You know what I mean? And it's a hard thing to deal with on the back side of something, if you haven't dealt with it on the front side, if you haven't thought about it or talked about it on the front side. And that conversation that I had with my wife and I was spurred by watching my friend Chris sell his business, do all the stuff, and he's moving to Arizona, getting ready to retire. I'm at the sand dunes, he calls me, he goes, dude, well, they told me I got pancreatic cancer, but I'm gonna beat this. Two months later, he was gone. Yeah. And then I go to see his wife, I, I go to visit him, and then I just happen to start talking to his wife and, and, and I'm thinking, this guy's got a 5,000 foot warehouse filled with parts. Yeah. And it's like, somebody's got to help her. You know what I mean? Like, and, and, and again, I'm helping, I'm, I'm helping her out of my friendship for my friend Chris, thinking, heaven forbid, if something like this happens to me, I hope one of my friends takes the lead, comes over and makes sure that my wife is, that my stuff's being dealt with where, it's not being thrown in the garbage and it's being, it's going to go to benefit my family. You know what I mean? Right. Because that's the thing. Sometimes we're so busy in the minutia of life that we never look up. Yeah. I certainly don't want to leave Kim with 
the burden of <laughs> what I have. Because when you think about it, when you lose someone and you see like, okay, wait, it's not just someone, it's that person's life and these parts and pieces of their life. And there's a whole process of dealing with all that. You know what I mean? But, you know, thinking about it on the front side, it, 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 some people think it's kind of morbid, but it's really a healthy way to kind of look at it because at least there's a plan. Right, right. We have to uh, prepare yeah. for the future. So anybody out there that doesn't have a trust yet, <laughs> yeah. and you have some property and you got family, get your trust in order. Well, yeah, if you care for them, because you know what will happen is if something happens to you, heaven forbid something happens, and then your family's dealing with like, oh, well, dad never got this situated. And then it's like you're dealing with titles and houses and and then heaven forbid it's not a trust and, the, and then the government says, right. we're going to take half. Right. Of that, it can be so ugly at a time. When Good you... thing that my dad worked really hard so that I could give half to the government because things weren't dialed in properly. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's it's an interesting way that that we can kind of wrap up this because this isn't gonna be our only podcast. We have to do another one. There's so many different things that we need to talk about as far as just like I, I want to do a technical one specifically where we do a deep dive into building engines because it's one of the things that you do is you know you build the the single port stroker motors which i think is is a really cool thing to do and there's lots of reasons to to go into one of those but i think this is this is really a good point to look at things and, and when you look at you know i was talking to a friend of mine he says we're all playing the back nine now yeah we're not getting we're, we're, we're we, and all of us are in this crazy hobby with a bunch of we start as a bunch of dumb 20 year olds you know 18 year olds getting in this thing all fired up about, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And it's, and it's become a huge part of our life. I know you through Volkswagens. I know majority of my, th- my friends. And, and I have a lot of friends that I, I go to church on a regular basis. I have a lot of friends through church. Volkswagens are like another equalizer like the, the gospel is. It's mm-hmm. like I have these friends that we have this common thread of commitment to. And because you're a Volkswagen guy and you've been in Volkswagens for a while, I know that you're gonna deal with the bull crap like I am. You're gonna you're, you're gonna get strand. You love this hobby so much. You're gonna put. You're gonna be. You're gonna. You're gonna be pushing your car. Thinking I'm a grown man pushing this car on the side of the road because I want to drive this dumb bug. But you love this hobby so much that you're willing to do that. So you, you, you're you're you have something that you enjoy so much that when I meet you and you meet me and we're both in the hobby for the right reasons, there's this common bond that we know the, the level of the level of commitment each one of us has, you know? And so it's, it's been, it's been uh, a great hobby, man. It's been oh, so fun for, for sure. me. So much fun. Yeah. It, and, it, and I've been all around the world, man. And, and going to Volkswagen shows. And if you, have you been to Europe yet for anything? No, but I've been to Japan. You, you need to go, you need to go to Europe. I'm telling you, it is the coolest thing ever because they're all the same as us. They're just yeah. a bunch of hardcore Volkswagen loving people that just love the hobby. And in retrospect, as I, you know, as I started this podcast, you know, you know, 2018, I look at things and I say, you know, I'm so glad. And, and I get emails from people like, I'm so glad you do this. There's so much in the hobby you're yeah. capturing. That's never been captured because today no one picks up a magazine to read it. No one goes through the, no one's going to take the time to do this stuff and then to get this stuff recorded and, and have it out here forever to be, listened to by your great, great, great grandkids and my great, great, great grandkids. And, and, and someone will hear it somewhere and say, Oh, that's, that's how that came about. Well, you mentioned magazines. I, um, I was blessed again in another way. Um, VW custom and classic called me and wanted me to advertise. And, and I said, uh, I don't think there's any room for me to advertise because we already are in hoppy dubs and VW trends business card ads. And uh, I don't think there's enough room in this Volkswagen industry for another magazine. And so I was not willing to advertise. But I, then I did say, because the guy was pretty persistent about trying to sell me some advertising. I said, look, the only way that I would advertise with you is if you were willing to uh, come down here and do some articles with us. You know, then I would consider paying for an ad because then we're going to get some coverage. Right. Right. So then the editor of the magazine called me and he says, um, I understand that you want to write some articles for us. And I never said I wanted to write <laughs> and write any articles, but my mind starts spinning and I'm like, yeah, I could do that. So um, I wrote for VW Custom and Classic for two years. Oh, yeah. I wrote technical articles. And um, 
the good part about that was that it gave me notoriety that I couldn't purchase because these magazines were filling up the whole Midwest, the areas yeah. that Hobby W's and VW Trends wasn't really popular in. And there's Volkswagen owners out there. And so my mail order business took off, which was great. Um, What's to change so much from like mail order to internet to, to, this, so to now someone can just come up on Instagram and now they're they're out of nowhere flashing the pen. Who's this guy that's nobody, no one in the industry knows him, but now he's right. getting all this business and it's, yeah. you know, it, 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 it's had, good and it's bad. It is. It's good and it's bad, but it's a different way. I had this conversation with my with a podcast I did with um, with uh, Paul Medhurst, who owns Type Two Detectives in the UK, and I said when we were young, we would look at one picture of a Volkswagen that we'd stare at for four years while we're building our car, and that was like that like that was our Instagram, that was our internet, yeah. and and like we talked about having to get bearing catalogs and all this stuff to cross reference things, and now. It's just a completely different world. Everything's happening so fast. There's such an overload of information. Such a you know, you're just trying to sift through something to make sense of anything. But yeah, it's a great it's a great hobby. I love everything that's happened. I love all my friends that I've met through it. I love the relationships that I have around the world because of this hobby. Yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun, and there's definitely room for us to do many many podcasts because there's so many stories that we've got. <laughs> there's, there's a ton I of mean, them. I've done so much stuff in Glamis and uh, uh, a little bit of drag racing and a little bit of off-road racing and um, well, driven, and driven I want Volkswagens. I want to I want to chronicle some of that stuff like those days, what was going on, why you were doing those things, and what was your motivation and and the and the learning curve that took place during yeah. that because I wasn't in that street race scene like like you would hope that I was, but um, in the off-roading, um, you know, not very many people have driven their Volkswagen from. Long Beach, California, to Glamis, yeah, and then beat him up in the dunes and made it back home. Well, uh, uh, again, there's there's the pr the desire and the process of doing that mandates that you do things a certain way. Yeah, and, you know? and I used to tow my Baja after that first trip of driving it there. So on that first trip driving it there, I barely made it back home. <clears throat> really? Yeah. No windshield, no reverse gear, tires going flat, engine just bleeding oil out of every orifice that. And Long Beach up. to Glamis is how many hours? It's uh, about five. <laughs> it's the same from here. Yeah, it's a long <laughs> drive. And that is a long, it's, it's a, a long, long drive and a sketchy, couple sketchy two lane roads. Yes. And then um, I started towing it with my stock 1969 bus with a stock 1600 single port. We would put a tow bar on the back and Roland and I, we would take an extra transmission and an extra engine and a box full of tools and tires and everything and load the bus up and tow the Baja out there. Well, I think this year, I think your goal is by November to have a car ready to go to ready to go to Florida because I want to do a cross country trip with a bunch of dudes in Volkswagens with a bunch of dudes in their women, yeah, whatever. But, okay, and so can, I want to go. I want to go cross country to the, this is the plan. I want to go cross country from here to Florida. We drive there, go to the show, hang out for the weekend, and then we rent a hauler to haul all the cars back, and we all fly fly home. home. That, that sounds like a good plan. So Kim is a trooper, you know. Um, she drove up here yeah. in my 66 Bug. Yeah, when you came to the One Crazy Weekend. Yes, for the One Crazy Weekend. <laughs> she rode passenger with me, and she says to me after we get here, she goes, can't you put air conditioning in these things? And I said, yeah, it could be done. She goes, aren't you the VW guy? And I'm like, well, kind of in a way, maybe. Some people may right. say that. But she goes, then I'm not riding in this thing again until you put air conditioning. And I'm like, oh, okay, I might have to do that. Well, I might have a surprise for you if we ever wrap up the podcast. Oh yeah, all right, Russell. It's been great, man. I appreciate you for coming. I know it's been a, it's been a long time coming, and from the first time I asked you to where you're at now, it's been since about just before, you know, it's been it's been a while. It's you've been, been while. you've been through a lot, yeah. and I'm glad that we're able to sit down and do this, and we will do more, man. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me, and it's it's been fun. A little intimidating, but fun. <laughs> you did great, man. All right, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. If you like that podcast, and I'm sure you did, make sure you share this podcast with your friends because we love that we grow the podcast organically by the listeners sharing it with their friends. So if you have some friends that love some genuine VW contact, content or don't even know that they're going to love some VW content, 
forward them a link to Let's Talk Dubs on whatever platform you listen to. And if you want a shout out on the podcast, make sure you guys give us a five star review on Apple Podcast and leave your name in the comments when you leave a review. So appreciate you guys for listening, man. And it's never too late. It's never too early to go book your room for one crazy weekend. One crazy weekend happen October 3rd through the 5th is going to be unbelievable. There are big, big things in the works. There was no car show weekend that's going to be like one crazy weekend, especially after this year. So you do not want to miss one crazy weekend coming up October 3rd to the 5th. Go to letstalkdubs.com for more information and book your rooms today. There's a link there where you can book your guys' rooms. Unbelievably affordable rates. Best rates of all the car shows you'll ever go to are the rates at the Orleans Hotel and Casino. So looking forward to that. And I can't wait to unveil unveil what's going to happen this year for one crazy weekend. So also in addition to that, we are going to be having a special award for the newest groundbreaking car that's going to be coming out something that breaks the mold and does something different a game changer award so we're looking forward to that you guys want to debut a car you bring it out to one crazy weekend i'll get into some of the details on that further in a podcast but if you win the top award at one crazy weekend for your car show being a custom over the top super dope volkswagen uh, not only will you be on the following year's shirt, but your next year's event will be paid for by One Crazy Weekend, hotel rooms, and uh, all that fun stuff. So that way you can bring your car the following year, get it put inside the hotel and casino on display since you won the previous year. And you'll be on the event shirt, plus we'll pay for your hotel rooms for the weekend. So lots to win besides just awards. So we'll get more into detail on that coming up on a future podcast. But I just want to let you guys know, you got a car, you're going to debut it. Debuted at one crazy weekend. Be the ultimate way to unveil your ride and win the ultimate prize. So until next week, guys. Later. You probably don't know that there's a new Volkswagen out that doesn't look like a Volkswagen. Volkswagen.